or maybe coming late. Um, so just to welcome everyone here and just remind you of the sensitivity of your microphones um, as it will pick up any other conversations outside of the, the meeting discussion. Um, today, members, as you well know, we have a very packed agenda. Um, we have two briefing sessions with um, departmental officials. The first is on the proposed uh, bill on the hospital parking charges regarding the, the, the Minister's request to defer the operational date. And later in the meeting, we'll have a second briefing from officials on primary care. The Royal College of GPs and the BMA GP committee would also provide briefings on issues within primary care as well. Um, we have the Institute of Public Health to brief the committee on the Westminster Tobacco and Vapes Bill. And the committee will also um, be asked to consider a written briefing on a proposed LCM in relation to the Westminster Victims and Prisoners Bill and two SORs relating to the misuse of drugs, um, which you'll have seen in your pack. So, as we do have such a, a large amount of business to get through, time will be very tight, and I would just ask members if we could, you know, be very, very mindful of that, um, and and keep questions limited. It's not to curtail anybody, but it's just that we have so much, and we want to get the best out of it. And we've also asked those coming in um, to to brief the committee to do the same in terms of their contribution. Um, so now I declare the meeting open. Oh, sorry, do you want to come in, Alan, before? Sure. Start? There's a high likelihood I'll probably have to leave early. Okay, no um, worries. Unforeseen circumstance at home, so. No problem, Alan, um, that's no bother. Thank you for letting me know. And I mean, it's both just in terms of time, I should say, that maybe if we kind of factor in about five minutes with those bigger briefings that we will want to prepare, just to give everybody a fair crack of the whip and, as I say, get the most out of it. Um, because we have had so many requests for, for briefings that we want to make sure everyone has got an opportunity. So if a member's happy enough with that, t just to keep that in mind. It sounds for a comfort break in the middle for even five, yeah, two minutes, I three minutes, so just to really stretch really. your legs and get your head clear to me. Because I there's no problem with that. Uh, Mom, so <laughs> we'll, we'll factor that in. I think that's actually a good point. So thank you for raising that. Um, Okay, members, so uh, uh, the meeting is now open to the public um, and just to advise members that the committee meeting is, will be recorded and broadcast <coughs> through Parliament buildings and online. Um, and for those in the public gallery, that we're welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted um, and that you can connect to the Assembly Wi-Fi. Passport details are available in the gallery rules, but we're not permitted <coughs> to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Are members aware of any apologies at the minute? I haven't received any. No? Okay. Um, item number two then is chairperson's business. Um, nothing major to raise, but I suppose we, some of us have, have been at the Marie Curie Hospice this afternoon, which was a really, really good meeting. And I want to just um, convey our thanks to the team at Marie Curie for allowing us to, to come and meet with them and to some of the patients who we had the pleasure of, of speaking to while we were there. Um, there's a couple of things coming out of the meeting that I think would be pertinent for us to potentially action. Um, my first suggestion would be that we could write to the Minister in relation to the palliative uh, care and end of life strategy. Um, we were it, it was raised with us that the, the existing strategy is out of date since 2015 um, and we are very keen to see that. Um, progressed and, and updated, particularly in light of, of COVID and other things that have happened since that has drastically changed the landscape in terms of palliative care and end of life care. Um, so are members content that we write to Minister for an update on that? Sure. Yes, sorry, Olivia. Can I, can I just add, maybe if we can start into the letter, um, to ask for an update from the Minister that mentioned around the funding model changing in the South, where hospices are 100% funded now <coughs> through statutory. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> provision. So, if we could just even ask Robin um, Swan if they're aware of that, or if there's, you know, any sort of conversations, or you know, yeah. any learning from that model. Absolutely. I think, yeah. Well, let me just ask. Sorry, I was I didn't hear the first bit that you said. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating what you said. But maybe about the inclusion um, of end of life strategy in the program for government. Maybe yeah, just uh, get an update government. from the minister on any work that he's done towards that. Yeah, that's okay. that's essentially. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Colm. Um, and the funding piece is very, very important. And as we've mentioned in the past, and we have a response that we can deal with through correspondence around the children's hospice. Um, we want to see the kind of the funding <coughs> model and how that, if there's plans to review that going forward, and um, what that will look like. So any update on that. So that's that's important. 
Um, I have nothing else under chairperson's business at this stage. But, oh, sorry, I, sh I should have just said, and coming out of that um, visit, it may be something that we want to consider as terms of, in terms of the committee's priorities um, on our strategic planning day. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, you know, we, ha we will be thinking about things like that in the next, you know, ahead of the meeting in, in two weeks' time. Um, so, I'm just putting that out there, if that's something people would like to to consider for, for one of the committee's priorities. Members, item number three then are the draft mi minutes. If it can refer you to tab three, which is page six of your meeting pack, are members content with the minutes as drafted? Content. Content, yeah. Um, I have no matters arising if anyone else has anything to raise on that one. No. Um, okay, members, item number five then is the Hospital Parking Charges Act 2022 and the proposed amendments. Um, if I can refer members to the correspondence from the Health Minister at tab 5, page 14 of your pack. The Department's implementation timeline is in members' table pa papers pack, which you would have received this morning. The Minister has confirmed that he plans to introduce a bill that will defer the operational date of the Hospital Parking Charges Act for two years, and he intends to seek accelerated passage for the bill. Officials from the Department are attending this afternoon to provide a briefing on the bill <coughs> and the rationale for seeking accelerating, accelerated passage. And just to advise members that um, on Monday, myself and the Deputy Chair, Danny, met with the Minister and officials to discuss this issue um, and, and to get an understanding of, of the Minister's rationale behind this. Um, for your information, under the accelerated <coughs> passage procedure, a bill can pass all its legislative stages in as little as 10 days. The process skips the committee stage scrutiny of the bill and accelerated pass passage does require cross-community support in the plenary. So um, that will be coming to us next week. Um, so just to remind members, we only have 30 minutes and we do need to really stick to that um, given the, the, the amount of business we have to get through today. So I'd just like to welcome Preda Miller, Amory Smith, Jeff Thompson and Brenda Craney who have kindly attended today to, to give us a briefing. So, We'll open up to yourselves. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for this opportunity to engage with you today on the hospital car parking charges. The Hospital Parking Charges Act 2022 prohibits the imposition of charges for parking vehicles in hospital car parks and is due to come into operation on the 12th of May. Its main policy objective is to abolish hospital parking charges across health and social care hospital sites in Northern Ireland for staff, patients and visitors. Trusts have been working to implement the legislative requirements by the 12th of May. However, due to legal challenges beyond our control, mm. the award of a contract for the traffic management solution has been delayed by about four months. So following resolution of these challenges, we now anticipate awarding the contract very soon. However, owing to implementation timescales, which includes ordering, delivery, installation and testing of the equipment, and then updating the signage and managing communication, the earliest we envisage the solution to be rolled out would be May, oh, sorry, September 24, which is after the new law is scheduled to come into effect. Many of you will already be aware of the traffic issues at our hospital sites, and advice from the Trust is that once parking is made free due to the likely surge in demand without the solution in place to manage the parking controls, they'll be unable to control the parking, preserve blue light routes, and protect designated spaces. Trusts are now significantly concerned about their ability to maintain safe access to sites for patients, clients, visitors and staff. The resultant congestion on sites and at access and egress routes will contribute to delayed or missed hospital appointments, including emergency treatments. Charges also differ across our hospital sites and set in line with local car parks to protect spaces from potential commuter demand. Free car parking at hospital sites without the controls in place could therefore increase demand for spaces from the public at the detriment of service users. In particular, this is expected to have a significant impact in the South Eastern and Belfast Trusts, so I'm joined by Jeff and Brenda today in that regard. For example, Belfast City Hospital is within easy walking distance of the city centre and free parking would make it cheaper alternative than public car parks and transport. It's expected on the Victoria Hospital site, which is already prone to serious incidents of gridlock, that parking queues will increase in length and time once <coughs> parking is free. This will put blue light routes under serious additional risk and may delay or prevent emergency service vehicles reaching their E-Day. In addition, gridlock to the adjoining roads, especially the Donegal Road, Broadway Roundabout and Grosvenor Road, 
will be negatively impacted and potentially increase congestion in these areas. Consequently, there's a fundamental problem now to address in order to protect access to hospital sites for service users. The Parking Charges Bill therefore proposes to modify the operational date of the Act by two years to May 26. The Minister has proposed to proceed with the option of making parking permits for eligible staff free of charge during the deferral period as a fair recognition of the hard work and dedication of HSC staff in order to deliver at least some of the intent of the Parking Charges Act. The deferral period will also be used to fully implement the infrastructure required for the implementation of free parking from May 26. As a consequence then of the extremely pressurised timeline to achieving a deferral in advance of 12th May and the associated risks which I have outlined there today, the Minister has written to the Health Committee to seek your agreement to accelerated passage and the standing down of the committee stage that would allow introduction of the Bill to the Assembly in week commencing 15th of April. So Jeff, Brenda, and Marie and I are now happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Brenda. Okay. Um, and I suppose just from the outset, I think certainly as it was one of my party colleagues who brought the bill forward, we we're very disappointed that we're at this stage that it hasn't been able to be implemented within the time frame, which was already extended um, when it was going through the assembly in the last mandate. Um, and it was it was um, brought through the assembly primarily to try and alleviate the costs for staff. And for, for those on, on lower incomes who are, are using the hospital, um, who would have been probably most negatively Im impacted by the cost of po hospital parking charges. So um, we are keen to see this implemented at the earliest possible stage. We understand that we're in a, a, an impossible situation. However, it is disappointing that we are here. Um, I suppose just a couple of questions, and we probably will draw a lot more out of this in the debate in the chamber. But mm -hmm. I mean, the, the two year timeline You've said that the infrastructure should be in place. Hopefully, it said in the papers August, but I'm assuming it's September. It's slightly yeah. changed. Mm -hmm. How confident are you that that's deliverable? Um, in two years' time, I'm confident that's deliverable. Just to give you a bit of context, you know, and what happened here is originally we thought that we could avail of a contractor from a national framework in August, but that national framework didn't come out, you know, to the anticipated time scale. We then had no choice but to pursue our own procurement route. And because we then had to react and pursue our own procurement route, we ended up trying, you know, through really accelerated processes, putting this out to procurement in October. Um, and then, unfortunately, the time scale was already so squeezed that when the legal challenges came, they've really thrown us out. In terms of your question, can we deliver this in the next two years? Yes. The contract I, I had said earlier in the week I thought would be would be awarded this week. I mean, told it's, it's either going to be this week or next week. There's just one trust waiting adv advice back from their solicitor to give the green light to proceed. But we are on the cusp of awarding this contract. Once that's done, there's a series of conversations to be had because each trust site is so different mm -hmm. and there are such different local issues they have to take into account that they will go through doing the surveys, tailoring the needs of the solution to those trusts. But we envisage a sort of six month time scale, you know, is the minimum that would be required and there will be a level of prioritization that has to be applied in terms of sites because one of the challenges hot hospitals are also dealing with is a rollout of Encompass, which is another digital system, and there's a digital angle to mm -hmm. the ANPR solution. So we're going to have to try and choreograph this, you know, to co basically to work around the Encompass rollout as well across our hospital sites. But I remain confident, and if Jeff and Brandy agree that two years is achievable. Right, my question was actually around the September 24. Yes, it was about the infrastructure, but I suppose you've answered that as well within yeah. that because you're saying the contract, you're confident the contract will be now awarded. The infrastructure will be in place by September at the latest. Is that what you're saying? Well, we're yet to appoint a uh, a contractor formally, um, and then there will be meetings that will need to be had with the contractor. Sorry, I'm Jeff. By the way, nice to meet you. Um, and. Um, we will have to have then a series of meetings with the contractor, on-site assessments, purchasing the items, the leading time to get them and then put them in place. So I would say September would be realistic, but I wouldn't guarantee it. You know, it would be a minimum time that I would have thought that we might be able to get the infrastructure in place. 
Yeah. If there are any unforeseen delays, could we could the committee be kept informed of that as well, if possible? Yes. So we could, yeah. Because I think we're at this stage now, two years on from the bill mm-hmm. being passed, that we don't want to see it pushed yeah. down the road any further. And I suppose going back to the two-year extension, and I've spoken to the minister as earlier in the week on this. Um, we would hope that that's not a target date that we are actually seeing yeah. it at an earlier stage than that where so possible. I think the assurance we can give you is that we you know there's no you know winding down or slowing down of anything mm-hmm. that's happening here regardless of whether we were to implement free charges or not we we absolutely need the parking controls at all our sites yeah. anyway and it it will proceed and it is proceeding so you know, we would, as Jeff says, you know, September is the very earliest, but I can see no reason, as we sit here today, why we will not have the infrastructure in place. And then what that time frame allows us to do is to actually see how it operates on the ground, work through any teething issues, make sure that, you know, we're not having to divert staff off in Compass to roll this out, mm-hmm. um, gives us time really to bed in the structures so that when we come to May 26, we are in the best position possible to implement the legislation. Okay, thank you. My only other question is in relation then to what's happening in the interim. Um, and you mentioned, Freda, in your um, introduction that staff will be given the permits um, free of charge. Now, I understand there's a limited amount of permits. So I suppose in terms of how the eligibility for, for permits will be um, determined, because Again, going back to my earlier point, the, the, the purpose of this bill was to ensure that those staff, particularly the likes of our nursing staff and, and others who are maybe at the lower end of the, the salary scale um, in our hospitals, but p- potentially working the longest hours in many cases, um, are, are footing a lot of the bill in terms of hospital parking charges. So if they're doing five days, some of them, which will be 12 hour shifts, um, potentially, that they are not, they're, you know, that's taken into consideration. And as, and as on the other side, for our patients and families who are using the hospital on a very regular basis, I know there's a permanent scheme, scheme or a support scheme in place already, but I don't feel it's well enough advertised. So if there's something that we can ensure that that is well advertised so that patients and their families aren't taking the, the hit as well, I think that's really crucially important until we get this um, fully operational. Um, so... In terms of the staff permits, yes, um, I know that you trust with me here already have applied criteria based allocation to permits and it's largely pitched from uh, the viewpoint of need. So it's, you know, which staff need to use their vehicles to deliver services? Are they blue badge holders? Are they working across multi-sites? Um, it's taken on a needs basis. One of the interesting things is I believe that the uptake of permits when the application um, open actually you find that uh, applications from lower from lower band staff tends to be lower than you might think because i think a lot of those staff don't utilize vehicles actually to access hospital sites which is one of the reasons why income criteria isn't actually applied It's, it's focusing more on a needs use and what is best for the end user of the service and for those delivering the service rather than um, looking at income criteria. But I don't know if Jeff and Brenda have you yeah, something. I, mean, I think it's, um, I'm the Director of Nursing in Belfast and certainly our criteria is based on, um, as Preda said, not only need and flexibility of the service, but shift working, for example, is a criteria. Um, caring responsibilities, either for a child or an older person, yeah. uh, disability uh, and so on. We've worked on the criteria with um, with our trade union colleagues very closely, but I do think it is an important point. A lot of our lower paid workers will live locally to either the city, the matter or the Royal. Musgrave Park and Belfast are slightly different, but we have, we have bus routes in, into there already. Um, and we're also working with TransLink. So it, it is that balance. Um, we're trying to encourage people where they can to either walk to work or take public transport from a sustainability point of view as well. And we will provide supports around public transport and we're working with TransLink around that. So it's very multifactorial. Um, I have to be honest though and tell the committee, if I'm a member of consultant medical staff, I will meet the criteria because I might be on three sites in a day. You know, I might have surgery in one one hospital do a clinic in another I will do on call I'd need to be in at different times of the day and night but certainly we allocate um, five people to every car parking space and we still have a capacity issue mm-hmm. particularly in the Royal and the city site 
um, and that's something we're working through at the moment. I suppose just, and then I'm going to open up to other members, but just, I take all the points that have been raised. Um, I suppose coming from a constituency that has a very large rural area, that uh, you know, nursing staff and other staff maybe don't have the, the luxury of being able to use public transport yeah. and other things, so they have to rely on a car. Yeah. That's why I'm saying that we need to take that into consideration. That is part of our criteria. If, mm-hmm. you, if you're on a route that requires more than two buses or a bus and a train, then you would have a higher level of the criteria than someone who could come on one bus. For example, in our trust as well, we have um, the distance from base to um, your home is um, taken into consideration. We also have an appeals process in place where um, someone who isn't successful first time round can submit an appeal. That will be heard by anonymous panel, and their appeal is sent anonymously. So the whole system is balanced around fairness. Um, so we are blind to, at that stage, the grade or any other circumstances. We're purely looking at exceptional circumstances, um, uh, and those things are picked up, particularly around Section 75 considerations. Thank you. Um, I have Colin. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Chair. Um, notwithstanding you as being here delivering this message today, I think that it's nonsense. I think there's been an institutional... Um, dragging of heels on this matter. I think that the department and trusts didn't want, they didn't like the bill, they didn't want the bill, they didn't want to see what was happening. Four years to put a control on the front of a car park. I mean, that's just virgin on ridiculous. The, um, I was in a hotel on Saturday uh, <coughs> night uh, attending a conference in the south and as part of that, as a hotel guest, you got a register rate. You simply handed them their card and they scanned it and handed it back to you. It took, it took seconds to have a system in place. Most of the car parks have current, um, you know, uh, sort of barriers that open and close. So it's just about how the card that goes into it is recognised. Um, so I think right back to the original um, discussions about the bill uh, in the Assembly Chamber, it was obvious that the department didn't want it. So um, I hope that we do see it. I, I wanted maybe just to ask you a couple of questions. Um, if it's going to take three or four months to get the, the, the company in place, why a two-year extension? If it's only going to take three months to actually put all the stuff in place, why is it going to take uh, a two-year extension? Which, in effect, from the department on that, is asking for two years to overturn a decision that this Assembly has already taken. Uh, and I don't rest easy um, with that. So the first question is about the two years. The whole way through the debate, there has been discussions about costs. How much of the costs associated with car parks is actually paying rates, which is circular money within government that's coming out of one department and going to another department to then come back to another department? So what percentage mm-hmm. uh, of the car park and costs, um, which was anchored as one of the main issues for not progressing it? And in terms of the... Um, excuses, and I'll, I'll highlight the Belfast Trust excuses. I find some of them just lame. You know that you know it's the you know the equality issues that it may prevent. Well, what about the equality issues of people uh, that actually uh, don't have the same income as others that need to get access to treatment? The the you know the blue light uh, protection of units. Maybe is there any detail on the assessments that have been undertaken, the traffic impact assessments that led to the decision that there would be an impact? Uh, on the blue lights, and is that available that could be circulated to the committee uh, to maybe let us have a look at that? Um, maybe just on, on those issues, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, certainly, from the Belfast Trust point of view, we can provide you with those assessments. Um, you may be aware if, um, if you've been on the Royal Hospital site recently, there's a lot of building work going on on the site. So, the number of access roads has been reduced to facilitate the new maternity hospital and the new children's hospital. Um, and we have we have limited access corridors through, which are shared at the moment, but we'll ha- we're happy to share that with you. Um, I can assure you we're not dragging our heels here. We're, our focus is um, to ensure that our staff, our patients and our visitors have equal access 
to our to our sites, um, and the royal site is a particular issue. Um, the other issue is the impact we have on the main roads. Preda has talked about the Grosvenor Road and the Broadway roundabout, and certainly we, we have worked with the road service, for example, to have lights put on the Broadway roundabout to try and increase the flow, because at times when those lights weren't on, you just could not move that round, through that roundabout. But unfortunately, because we only have two access roads to our car parks, they become incredibly congested. And we, um, we at the minute, we have 75% of our staff in the public car parks because we don't have enough. We don't have enough car parks for staff at the moment who would meet the criteria. <coughs> so we are working through that. Um, our trade union colleagues and all of our staff are very aware uh, and are working with us on this, but it is very, very challenging. And you know, we have people at the moment who are phoning from queues saying, "My child's got an appointment in the children's hospital. I can't get in." You know, people having to work around that. So there are the realities we're dealing with because of a very congested site. But please be assured, we're not dragging our heels. We're trying to manage. But you're dealing with those issues now. Yes. That's before you even go into it, that's you're dealing with them now and, yes. and haven't had to remedy them. So No, no we're re- we are attempting to remedy mm-hmm. them at the moment with the application of the criteria, firstly, uh, and secondly, to to ensure that our, our visitors and our patients have access. And um, we do have criteria for the cancer centre, for critical care, whether that's in the children's hospital in the city or in the Royal, where we provide car parking passes. But that is dependent on the car park being available for the person. you know. And we do have criticism from our local residents about misuse of the public streets around their homes, which I understand. So I'm just coming back then to address your other two questions. So in terms of the rates, I think you're looking at about 50%, about it's just over four and a half million of the total costs are paid out in rates and the bulk, and then the vast majority of that four and a half million will be across the Belfast and Southeastern Trust sites as well. In terms of the two years, so we're saying, you know, with a fair wind and if everything goes to plan we would like to think in six months time we would have you know we would have rolled out the controls that we're talking about um the there is a reality of obviously i think everybody's aware that the financial situation of the department has deteriorated quite a lot since this bill passed a couple of years ago the thing i can assure you about is i can hand on heart say we have worked very very hard to try and implement this by the 12th of may it's unfortunate that we couldn't avail of that contract from the national framework that really sent us in you know that basically really delayed the process for us having to go through our own independent procurement um and unfortunately then the legal challenges which are completely outside of control have now pushed us beyond the 12th of may so we would have liked to have had the infrastructure in place notwithstanding budget pressures because i can only see benefits of that for all of our service users if that was if that technology was already implemented and we could have that you know as a control on our parking sites colin um i'll um, <clears throat> jeff thompson southeastern trust um i'm i'll just speak on behalf as well of my colleagues across the region who aren't here today um, Encompass is going to be a big project that is um, consuming a lot of time for our IT um, folk. And I know from talking to them at regional meetings, they're concerned with the capacity and capability of trying to get this through and give you another false um, idea of time scale. Two years is realistic when, when you consider all the work that needs to be done. Um, particularly um, when I've heard from colleagues in the Western Trust who are at the end of the queue for Encompass. Um, So two years is an absolute deadline for us to allow everything to be phased in. Some of us could do it quicker, but then you're into the problem that it needs to be a regionally consistent approach. Thank you. Um, Alan Robbins. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Is the committee privy to the nature of the legal challenges. I find it difficult to get my head around yeah. why someone would wish to it's challenge something that is of benefit to the sick and to those low-paid workers. So Do you expect any other legal challenges beyond what you currently have faced? 
No, so what's happened is whenever the procurement concluded <coughs> in November, right, and our COPE was looking looking at the tenders that had come in, and then what happens is you get letters that go out to the unsuccessful and successful bidders, and at that point, unsuccessful bidders lodged procurement challenges, right, to legal challenges. The two, so writs were served. I'm not even privy uh, to exactly what the nature of those writs are. They then go in through our solicitors. But what happens is when there's a challenge to the procurement like that, you automatically have to pause the procurement. You're not allowed to award the contract until you resolve the challenges. And they have now, with some to in and froing, been lifted. So we are in a position now that as soon as our final trust gets the go-ahead from their solicitor, we'll be able to award this contract, which is why I'm saying we're very imminently going to be able to award it. So on this day, the 11th of April, yeah. 2024, the four presenters here today can give a cast iron guarantee that in May 2026, this will be implemented. Any takers? I, I would hope so. As, <laughs> as, yeah. And what we could say four is, years, hand on so. heart, the four it's of us tough can, cannot at this time foresee a reason why it won't be possible, but I'm, I'm a prudent kind of person and I wouldn't like to, to bet my life on it. <laughs> but, but I think, Peter, in fairness, whilst a lot of us, as you know, who gave uh, evidence to this committee four years ago did raise our, our concerns about the impact once the legislation was passed, we have been working diligently to, to implement it, notwithstanding our concerns. Um, uh, but unfortunately, the contractual uh, challenge was beyond all of our control. So we will, we will work with this um, to implement it as soon as possible. But as Jeff says, Encompass, I mean, we're quite lucky. You've already gone live. Belfast are going live on the 6th of June with Encompass. Mm -hmm. So we will have more... Um, we will have more IT capability once that's in place compared to other colleagues who are later in that programme. And we just need to be mindful and honest, I, I feel, about that as Even well. Even where we have implemented Encompass, there's a whole backlog of IT that they need to Update. catch up on. So. OK, OK. Alan, Alan Chambers? Oh, thanks, Chair. Uh, it just remind the, the committee that when this bill uh, went through the Assembly, it was a very popular bill, obviously, but it was one of many that were getting pushed through at the last minute. So maybe there was a, a lot of the, the fine detail that maybe we, we didn't ask the right questions at the time. But if you recall, uh, the bill was actually proposing that these schemes would be introduced six months after royal assent of the bill was given. Uh, and we can see now how totally unrealistic that would have been and the pressures that that would have put on everyone. Um, and the minister came forward in the department with the, uh, the amendment that it would be extended for, for two years to give everybody that little bit of, uh, of extra time. Now, I know that it's, it's the, the people that are going to benefit from it are the families, as the chair has pointed out, that, it, that it's a financial burden. Uh, they actually have to pay uh, for car parking. Now, any of us that have been recently um, visiting hospital sites, I recently sat for a very uh, stressful 45 minutes at the Ulster Hospital to try and achieve, get a, a, a parking space. Uh, I've had the same experience at the, at the Royal and been really late uh, for an appointment. Um, so will this, th th this whole scheme, will it make the experience of both patients and visitors coming to the hospital, will it make it more uh, less uh, stress stressful experience? Or are the queues still going to be there? Are we still going to have to wait half an hour uh, to see a car coming out for us to get in? You know, will that change? Or is that going to be the same? The other thing is, I know you have uh, you've mentioned it there earlier, but what about uh, the queues that are going to be? Uh, you know, the queues are worse than ever, and if something's free, people want a bit of the action, particularly those people who may want to abuse it. Um, so, you know, will there be? I know you've said you've worked with uh, the road services and so forth, but can you guarantee that there won't be absolute traffic chaos around hospital sites? And can you guarantee? Because I know in the experience in Scotland. One of the real downsides was the, uh, the uh, high at, 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 at 
fouled up the, the, the blue light routes into the hospital. And, and, and that's, that's life and death. That's life and death for people. So I'm wondering if, if that has all been uh, considered. The other thing, we're hearing all about the, you know, the, the, the equipment having to be procured and everything else. But what we haven't heard and what we were not told uh, during the debate uh, was how it's going to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. How are we going to prevent, we haven't heard this, how are you going to stop the person coming in and parking and going down, walking down into the city centre from the Royal site to do their, their day of shopping and come back five, six hours later? Now, I presume you will have, I'm sure you're thinking about that and you will have thoughts, but the committee need to know that. We, we, I don't know what, how you're going to approach it. I, I know all what you're doing, trying to get the, the barriers and all the rest, of, but I don't know what's going to happen how it's going to work on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'd like to, I'd like to hear maybe how you would, uh, you know, how you're going to control it, and can you share that with, with, with the committee? Are you in a position now to share it, or is it something that's still in development? So there's going to be an element of the two in that we have an idea of how we envisage this will work, but until we've worked through it in detail with the contractor, we we probably can't, you know, give you a lot, like a lot of very detailed information. But essentially, the way this will work is, vehicle will come in, its number plate will be picked up, that vehicle will be allocated a three-hour slot. Say now, that's still something we're refining the appropriate time periods, but it will be given a slot. That slot will then expire after three hours, and that person would then need to be reapplying. So uh, why do you know that? that I'm legitimate. If I drive in and I'm intending to get down to Marks and Spencer's in the city centre, mm -hmm. how will you know that, that I'm a legitimate visitor to the hospital? I'm happy to let uh, you. Alan, hello. Um, I think um, one of the most insightful comments that was given to me was by a contractor when the bill, the original bill was introduced and he said, Jeff, from now on everything's going to be a compromise it's not going to be the same. So what we need to do from there is use the time that we've got to plan and work with the contractor. So in terms of the experience, I'm hoping by getting the AMPR in place, we won't see any detriment to the experience, but I can't see it improving the experience, Alan. That's um, because essentially the issue that we've got on our Belfast sites and our major acute sites is one of capacity on the site to deal with car parking. Um, so we can mitigate that to an extent with um, controls on AMPR to try and allow those people on site that we want and discourage people that we don't want. And then we can look at park and ride schemes and other types of um, uh, uh, other means of building additional capacity, which we're looking at at the moment and doing. Um, so queuing will probably be um, the same, but mitigated with more off-site parking options. The experience will be similar. We won't be able to 100% um, stop unauthorized parking, but the AMPR technology will allow us to see patterns, mm -hmm. and it does obviously have links to DVL up DVLA, um, so that parking charge notices can be issued to people who are really abusing the system. Overall, I would hope that um, with careful planning, working with the contractor, we'll be able to set up specific parameters mm -hmm. for each hospital car parking site that will meet the needs of those people. It takes time. Well, I, do, I, I mean, appreciate all the work you're putting in. I'm not criticising it, by the way. I really sympathise with the task that you have. But really, the message is, it's not going to be in any better experience for visitors or patients going to hospital sites. There's no benefit going to accrue to those people. Uh, can I make a comment on that? Yes. Um, one of the, I, I said earlier that 75% of our staff and visitor car parking is used by staff at the moment. If we're able to implement the criteria appropriately and our staff work with us, we should see an improvement in that aspect, i.e. less staff needing to use the visitors' car parks. But unless that happens, it won't be a better experience. So that's why we have to do a very, very close piece of work with our staff, encourage use of off-site parking, which also comes at a cost. Um, uh, at the moment, we, um, we provide park and ride at Black's Road into the Royal. 
it's not very well used. And it's certainly there, the sorts of options we're looking at. We're also looking at park and ride on the Musgrave Park site, which is not as congested a site as the Royal or the City. Um, I, I do think in relation to the automatic number plate recognition, that will be a case of getting the right public messages out there. If you overuse this system and you're not a visitor, we will fine you. Mm-hmm. But it's getting people to work alongside us in doing that. Certainly for me, the, the, the key priority for me is patients coming for appointments, for treatment, and their relatives and their visitors, and we really need to get our public on side with us yeah. with that. But for the record, I have every sympathy with the staff, and they shouldn't be paying for parking. Thank you. I'm very, very conscious of time as we are running on. Um, I've got Orlea and then Alan for a quick point, and then I'm going to have to... Yeah, no, I'll, I'll be up. quick, sure. Thank you. And just, I mean, on Alan's last point there, the benefit is help and save money for those staff that are paying these car parking charges and the patients that are paying the car parking charges but with all that said of course we know with the congestion the traffic issues because they're dealing with that now it's not going to go away because there's still you know th- those issues remain um but that was the purpose and the intention of bringing the bill forward in the first instance i just wanted to ask um in terms of the timeline then so um so just to be clear so the the contract will hopefully be awarded over the, the coming weeks, hopefully. Um, and then that will, so you're looking at a date around September 24 for the, the system to be in, in place, but not to be fully active um, and functioning until between six months to two years. Mm-hmm. So my question is around how does the, the department and the trusts um, intend to plan for that, you know. So, are you going to put in place some form of timeline to try and, you know, work towards the six month mark? Um, but you know, obviously, then you'll factor in there might be slippage at different points. But are you going to try and set a timeline to work towards the six months so you just aren't working towards, you know, right to the end of that two year period? And then just the issue around the encompass. So, again, conscious that. It's something like 80,000 staff who were told the other day is involved in having to be retrained and brought through a whole new IT system. Um, but, Jeff, just the point around um, the Encompass system then maybe hindering that six month period and pushing you towards the two year. The, the Encompass is going live in the Belfast Trust in the next 60 days, hopefully towards then the spring and maybe the winter then with the remaining two trusts. So, how many? In terms of the IT staff, how big an issue will Encompass itself be on us trying to work towards the sixth month mark to get this system up and running? That's that's really my point. I know it's impacting on all of the staff trying to yeah, deal with the um, new system, but for this specifically? Well, on the, in the South Eastern Trust, we've introduced Encompass, so our experience is going to be very different to other trusts. That's, I suppose, the the message that I want to get across. And whilst it may be possible for us to not only get the uh, equipment installed in six months, but get it operational soon after, um, I know there are concerns from our colleagues where Encompass will be being implemented after that six months, and the lead in time to Encompass is just going to swamp IT's ability to be able to make those connections that are needed it um, tends to be around, I don't know, I'm not a computer person, but IP links and things like mm-hmm. that. It's, it's getting the, net, the networks, those peripherals, into the servers. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm told. Mm-hmm. And that's the issue. Is there it's any opportunity for even trust to <coughs> collaborate on this? So I'm thinking of some mm-hmm. of the staff from Southeastern. I don't know how practical that is, but I'm just trying to think of ways that might be able to help. There's certainly, um, we're working very, I think South Eastern Trust are tired looking at the Belfast Mm -hmm. Trust at the moment. We're working very, very closely, learning not only as we go forward with this, but learning the um, impact on the IT capacity. Certainly, uh, you know, we, we're expecting this contract to be awarded in the next two weeks, and then we will start to work to implement that contract. Interestingly, Claire, my colleague who's behind us, she and I have had the conversation this morning. We don't think we have enough IT physical resource, so we think we need to look at that already. Okay. And we could work with her colleagues in South Eastern Trust to identify that resource. Um, certainly, Encompass for us is a patient safety system, mm-hmm. um, but there are the key links and the, um, the links to staff well-being and staff availability 
which are mixed across Encompass and this system. Yes. So at the minute, for example, we have, we have different systems in all of the hospitals in Belfast. To have one, get all the people on, mm-hmm. we need to work with the other systems to get that right. Yeah. But certainly I do think we need to have additional IT resource and we're already having those conversations. But I would also say when, when Encompass is in, um, we've already flagged it up at a later phase of Encompass that there will be a patient booking platform within Encompass and then hopefully in a years to come, a couple of years when this is rolled out, we'll, they'll be able to put in their registration vehicle details when they're booking an appointment and it'll streamline the whole process. Yes. So. Well, Mm-hmm. We maybe just get the t- if there is a timeline that you are working yes, towards, yeah. Preda, when you get the contract in place, if okay, the committee yeah. could see that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just very quickly, because I'm very conscious we're way over time now. But you'd mentioned PCNs. Will they be enforceable somewhere in the way in which PCNs are enforced on DFI-owned land? Or will this be deemed as private land and you will see a deluge of people looking to challenge these? We already use this approach uh, on our um, on the Royal and the City side at the moment and we do enforce them. Now we do give people right to appeal. You know, if, if I've gone to a clinic and I thought I'd be three hours and I didn't pay for enough car parking and I'm five hours, well we wouldn't uphold that. So we, we have a company at the moment who actually provide us with that service. Thank you. The, the final comment I just want to make on it is I know Scotland have brought this in um, has there been any engagement with them and how it's working and what you know what's been the feedback from them and then I'll stop. I was chatting to a uh, manager in Lothian NHS during the week um, and they when they introduced it there were a lot of issues and still remain a lot of issues with congestion and I think Alan made reference and I think it was Lothian um, that had 45 minute waiting time for ambulance services um, as a result of the congestion they can get on site so there are real dangers around us not planning for this properly and that's why we need the two years not just to get the equipment in but to plan for it as well so Scotland they're over the hump but they still do see that there are um, an increased demand um, on the car parks as a result of the change um, and then they're dealing with that consequence around the site as well. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, I suppose we have run over time, but we do appreciate it, and we'll probably thrash this out a wee bit more in the debate um, next week. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, so just on the, on the back of that, can I I'll just very quickly run through then the next bit? Um, are members content then with the Minister's proposal to seek accelerated passage for the bill? No, can I register no on that, please? Just uh, even just have it noted. <coughs> Anyone else? Everyone else happy enough? Do, do we need to go to a vote or anything? No. Okay, thank you. Um, the bill will be introduced on Monday the 15th of April and the accelerated passage motion will be debated on Tuesday the 16th, which will immediately be followed by the second stage of the bill if accelerated passage is approved. And I think it's important to note that there's probably none of us here that are happy with it. Nope. However, the, the, the alternative is that the legislation will then be breached if it misses the deadline. So um, I feel that we're in an impossible position. I certainly have expressed my disappointment at the start of the meeting that we're in this scenario. When's um, that date, Chair, did you say? For the, 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 for the, the debate. second stage. The debate is on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Next Tuesday? Next yeah. Tuesday. yeah. Thank you. Uh, the bill will be introduced on Monday the 15th. The debate will be on Tuesday on the accelerated passage motion. Monday. And second stage of the bill um, will be followed then if accelerated passage is approved. Okay, members, and just again to remind, we have so much to get through here if we can really try and keep our questions brief. Um, the next item is item number six, is the LCM on the tobacco and vapes bill and it's a briefing from the Institute of Public Health and we have representatives here um, to brief the committee on the inclusion of the North in the provisions of this bill um, that has been laid by Westminster. If I can refer you to tab 6, page 23 of your pack um, and there's a short briefing paper at page 10 of your table papers as well. Um, we have had 40 minutes but I'm I think we're probably going to have to cut that back. So if we can keep it as brief as possible, thank you. Oh, 
I'd just like to welcome then we have Dr. Helen McAvoy, who's the Director of Policy, um, Dr. Joanna Purdy, the Development Officer, and Dr. Kira Reynolds, who is a Development Officer as well with the Institute. So we're, you're all very welcome and thank you for your patience. Um, we run a little bit over time if we could open up then to yourselves to, to make your um, remarks. Great, great. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present to the Health Committee uh, today. Uh, I'm Director of Policy at the Institute of Public Health uh, in Ireland and uh, we've provided a briefing note on the organisation and its background and I'm here today with my colleagues uh, Dr Joanna Purdy and Dr Kira Reynolds. Um, I suppose I'd first like to open by saying that uh, the Institute of Public Health strongly supports the adoption of this legislative consent memorandum relating to the Westminster Tobacco and Vapes Bill. Um, I understand that a copy of our response to the UK consultation on the bill uh, has already been shared with the committee. Um, so in our statement today, my colleague Joanna will focus on, uh, particularly on the impact of the smoke-free generation measure in Northern Ireland, which is the proposal to uh, prohibit the sale of tobacco to anyone uh, born after 2009. And my colleague Kira will share some findings from an evidence re review that we conducted for the Department of Health on the uh, health effects of e-cigarettes among children and the implications that that may have for future decisions on e-cigarette regulation. Um, and I'll then conclude with just a few general points relating to the legislative process and, and a few of the key issues to consider um, going ahead. So I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Joanna. Thank you, Helen. Good afternoon, members. I've been involved um, for over a decade now in tobacco policy, working with the Department of Health and the Public Health Agency. As you'll know, the department recently published an end-of-term review of the 10-year tobacco control strategy for Northern Ireland, and this showed some hard-won progress in terms of tobacco use. In particular, there was good progress in reducing tobacco use among children. When we look back a decade ago to 2013, 13% 13 of 11 to 16 year olds reported that they'd ever smoked a cigarette, but by 2022 that figure had fallen to 8%. Again in 2013, 4% of young people smoked cigarettes regularly, defined as at least once a week, and now that figure is at 1%. So we can see the progress that has been made. We've also seen progress in reducing smoking among adults, although this hasn't um, this has been less impressive than the reductions in young people. Currently, 14% of the population aged 16 and older smoke cigarettes, compared with 22% a decade ago. Northern Ireland has seen some success in reducing tobacco use through measures such as tobacco taxation, regulations on marketing and standardised packaging. But it has become clear that incremental progress is not enough to respond to a product that kills two-thirds of its users. Despite the measures we have in place, children continue to start smoking and people who smoke continue to find it difficult to stop. There's also no doubt that Northern Ireland is still in the throes of an epidemic of tobacco-related harm. The epidemic of disease, disability and early death falls most heavily on the disadvantaged in our society. Around 2,200 deaths in Northern Ireland are caused by smoking. Lung cancer deaths are twice as common in the most deprived communities than in the least deprived. As MLAs, I understand that you're keen to see a return on investment from any legislative changes to regulate tobacco. While we have no modelling specifically on the impacts for Northern Ireland, I would like to share with you some of the insights sorry, from the modelling study that was conducted on English data. The Department of Health and Social Care in England modelled changes in smoking prevalence across 14 to 30 year olds in England arising from a smoke-free generation measure. The most conservative estimates are for a reduction of under 10% in smoking initiation rates and it's estimated that 11,466 smoking related deaths could be avoided within the next 50 years by 2075, saving the government £67 billion. When we look at a reduction of 90% in smoking initiation rates, that would equate to over 28,500 fewer smoking-related deaths by 20, 2075, and again generating a saving of up to £121 billion. Although the bill is an important step in creating a smoke-free generation, it's not a silver bullet for reducing smoking and the harm it causes. There still will be many adult smokers in Northern Ireland for some time to come. The projections of the English modelling studies are for 2075, which is some, some time away. So the bill is important. In fact, it's very important. But I hope the committee will be open to the future 
in the future to considering other measures um, because we cannot rely simply on one, um, one piece of regulation. An ever-evolving package of measures is needed. I think it's also critical to sustain appropriate investment in what we know is already working, including investment in enforcement of existing laws and high-quality smoking cessation services. Thank you, and I'll hand over to my colleague, Kira. Thank you, Joanna. So in the previous session on this bill, committee members expressed concerns about the use of vapes by children and the ease of access to, product, to, to these products in their constituencies. These observations are borne out by the official data. Experimentation is common. A fifth of 11 to 16 year olds have ever used a vape at least once. Among year 12 children, 44% have ever used a vape. What is most concerning is the trends for children becoming regular users of vapes. 6% of 11 to 16 year olds regularly vape, a doubling since 2016. While we see higher use among older teens, it is deeply concerning that very young children are also experimenting. 6% of children in year 8 who were as young as 11 or 12 reported ever using vapes. Since February 2022, the sale of vapes to children is prohibited and it is an offence to purchase or attempt to purchase such products on behalf of a child. This legislation is important to protect children and young people, but it is our view that the minimum legal age of sale is not enough on its own to deter children from vaping. The IPH developed an evidence review to support the Department of Health in responding to concerns around youth vaping. This work was a rapid review of systematic reviews investigating the health effects of vaping among children and adolescents. The review found strong, high quality evidence of an association between vaping and subsequent cigarette use, supporting a gateway effect of these products. It also found some evidence to support the association between vaping and having asthma, incidence of coughing, as well as associations with mental ill health and other substance use. The Legislative Consent Memorandum can provide the Assembly with appropriate powers to respond to a rise in vaping by children in Northern Ireland. This is necessary, as vaping harms children's health, addicts children to nicotine and increases their odds of taking up tobacco use in the long term. The next phase of work at Westminster and within the devolved nations will be to agree the details in relation to the regulation of retail of vapes across the UK. IPH has set out some recommendations on these details as they relate to vape packaging, display, pricing and flavours in our response to the UK consultation. Thank you. Um, Thank over. Thanks, Kira. So, uh, in conclusion, I think there's never been a more important time for legislating on tobacco. Um, the epidemic of tobacco related disease rages on across uh, the UK, Ireland and, and Europe. Uh, one in seven people aged 16 and over smoke in the population, which is leaving too many people vulnerable to serious disease. Um, the health system at all levels is struggling to respond to the scale and the complexity of illness in the population, much of which is driven by uh, tobacco use. Um, I'd like to reassure you that the measures in the bill are strongly supported by the general public. 79% of Northern Ireland respondents to the UK consultation are in favour of the smoke-free generation measure. But if we also look at representative surveys of the general public in England, in Scotland, in Wales and in Ireland, they all show strong support for the measure. People have had enough of the harm caused by smoking. Um, and I think people are, it is, it's not right that a quarter of year 12 children are now vaping. But it would be dishonest of me to suggest that everyone is a fan of these proposals. Some will argue that it's radical, prohibitionist, nanny statism or anti-choice. But I would say that the aim of the legislation is to protect children from starting to smoke in the first place. No child who tries a cigarette or a vape for the first time has the intention of becoming hooked for life. The bill is not an attack on smokers. There is nothing in the bill which will prevent today's adult smokers from accessing a tobacco or e-cigarette product. The Public Health Agency, together with the Health and Social Care Service, pharmacies, community and voluntary agencies, will continue to work very hard to provide free support to anyone who wants to escape nicotine addiction, whether they smoke, whether they vape or whether they use both products. So it's also probable that the tobacco industry will oppose um, the bill. The industry has a track record of resisting and delaying regulation through a variety of means and using quite extensive resources. And this is not without consequences for the policies to regulate tobacco and the lives of individuals and families. 
Um, I'm concerned that parties with a commercial interest will use all means available to them to discredit the legislation and to undermine the confidence of those in decision-making positions. So I think we will all need to be very alert to the possibility of inter industry interference in all its guise guises as this legislation progresses. Um, the Legislative Consent Memorandum document of the 21st of March has identified that bringing forward primary legislation could increase the risk of direct uh, litigation for Northern Ireland by the industry um, and I think uh, it could potentially provide the industry with additional avenues to disrupt enactment of regulation in the region um, and I think that is why the legislative consent motion uh, process is, is preferred. So in conclusion uh, and to echo the, the words of the, the CMO, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to make a big step forward in the tobacco endgame that we have all said we want in the policies. Um, I want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present to the committee, uh, acknowledge the support of my team um, and of the committee clerk uh, to get us here today because I know all your timelines are extremely tight around uh, this piece of legislation and uh, the Westminster Bill. So um, I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, and, and thank you all for that um, very in-depth briefing. I think it's certainly been very useful for us to hear as a committee. We've been supportive of the bill um, to date anyhow, and you've said a lot of what we have, have discussed in, um, in, in, in our discussion to date with, with good information there, I think, that will help us moving forward as, as this uh, progresses. I suppose there's no real questions as such because you've you've probably answered a lot of that in your in your contribution. Um, the only thing I will say is we had we had mentioned in, in previous discussions around the, the importance of North South alignment um mm -hmm. uh, on an all island basis, particularly um the fact that there will be disparities in legislation in the north in comparison to what's in place in the south, for example, um the, the banning of single use vapes <coughs> in the north and then that not happening in the south and, and the impact that may have and likewise um you know around the this piece of legislation and we, we when we had officials in they they told us that there has been conversations which is obviously very good and we hope to see that moving in pace then in line with what we're trying to do here so um just if you have any view on that um or anything you would like to add in relation yeah, to that um i suppose uh, uh at the top level, I would say that the tobacco strategies in Northern Ireland and in Ireland are heading towards a common goal, which is to reduce smoking prevalence to less than 5% mm -hmm. um, and to you know, reduce the level of tobacco <coughs> harm uh, in the population. Um, in the main, there has been, uh, they may have, the legislation tends to converge together towards the same end. There may be slightly different measures achieved uh, in place to do that. Uh, for example, in, in Northern Ireland, the uh, protection from tobacco uh, regulations in 2012 banned the sale of tobacco from vending machines, and that has only just been introduced in Ireland now in, mm -hmm. in, in 2024. So that's quite a big gap. But So there's areas where Ireland have uh, moved forward uh, and Northern Ireland have followed. There's areas where Northern Ireland have moved forward and, and Ireland has have followed. And I think uh, the the uh, there there's slightly different. There's always been small differences in relation to the tobacco taxation and pricing and so on. So I don't think any of those measures or any uh, lack of uh, measures happening at the same time is a good enough reason not to progress. Mm -hmm. Do you know so? Uh, for example, I think the point of sale display where the tobacco products had to be hidden behind a, in, in, a, in a cupboard behind the counter came in in 2012 where in Northern Ireland where they were in in 2009 in Ireland. So, uh, I, you know, there will there will be some perhaps some small differences in the, the timing in which these measures come in. But I think ultimately they will start to match each other as time goes on. No, absolutely. And I yeah. suppose the point I was making wasn't that um, we should be holding back. It, it was more that we should be working with our, our kind of parts in the side to encourage them to move with us where possible so that we don't, we don't have the opportunity, particularly like, and I'm coming from a, a border yes. area yeah. where there's an opportunity then for black market and all of those types of things that could cause greater difficulty. So it's just, that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. But um, I take your point on that there have been differences in the past. We've been able to work through them and there's things that can be done. But that awareness yeah, absolutely. Of, of what could happen, um, I think it's important to be to be cognizant of as well. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay, is any, any other members um, wish to ask Nuala? 
Um, yeah, just a brief question. Um, appreciate the time, and there isn't anything you said I would disagree with. Um, I think those the figures are just, I mean, they're not shocking because we see so much of it. I mean, there's there's shops that actually sell the kids in uniform, and there there is action that has been taken against those shops. Um, but we see many many young kids in uniform. I've seen them in primary school uniform, and um, vaping, which is it, it's really sad. And anything that we can do that actually eventually sees a generation of people who have never smoked is great. Um, I also think that we um, there is a balance to be struck around those who um, want to um, stop smoking and are perhaps <coughs> moving on to vapes um, a, a, as a mechanism to, to stop. So I know that there, we want to be careful and there is a balance in assisting people with that. But um, in terms of the uh, research into long-term effects of vaping um, and specifically on children, um, like any research and work like that would be beneficial to us as a committee um, and to work with us in terms of ensuring that that research is 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 shared um, any new if research that has come up even globally um, that can be pointed to um, would be beneficial because it is still a newish area yeah, absolutely, and, and we would certainly share the findings of, of the, the evidence review, but there's other pieces of work as well that you may find uh, of interest in, in, in that regard. I think in relation to the children, the reason that uh, we have a concern particularly around the older teens, but around the younger ones, is that the younger a child is when they're exposed to nicotine, the more ingrained the nicotine addiction will come and the harder it is for them to quit later on because the brain is still developing and the connections are still forming there. So um, uh, we, the, the idea that these kids are just experimenting and then not converting to regular use is simply not borne out by the patterns that we're now seeing in the, in the data. Uh, thank you. Um, no one else has indicated, so just I want to thank you for, for taking the time. It's been definitely very useful for us and it's a conversation where, that is ongoing, so thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, members, the, the evidence that has been provided by uh, the IPH will be reflected in the committee's report um, uh, on, on this issue, so we will be taking that forward as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all the best. Um, okay, members, item number seven then is the Westminster Victims and Prisoner Bill. Uh, relating to the infected blood compensation scheme, if I can refer you to the correspondence from the Minister at tab 7, which is pa page 81 of your pack. The Minister advises that a Westminster Bill, the Victim and Prisoner Bill, which is currently making its passage through Westminster, has been amended to include a clause that will require the Secretary of State for Health to establish a body to administer a compensation scheme for victims of the infected blood scandal. The clause was passed at the report stage in the House of Commons and the Bill is currently at committee stage in the House of Lords. Um, as this bill currently only applies to England and Wales, an amendment to extend the legislation to the North and to Scotland needs to be made in order for a UK-wide scheme <coughs> to be established. Um, the Minister advises he has written to the Executive to seek agreement in principle to the bill being amended to extend the provisions for an infected blood compensation scheme to the North, and this will be pending a request for legislative consent from the Minister for the Cabinet Office. Members, could we get agreement then to schedule a briefing from the department if the executive approves the minister's request? Yeah. yeah so. um, and, sorry, Danny, go ahead. Uh, could I also ask, I know we've noted um, that Haemophilia UK and Haemophilia Northern Ireland also support um, a single scheme, a UK scheme. Could they be invited up as well um, to give us a briefing at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, thank you. And I think just uh, something I would uh, would seek clarity on, him, and the minister may be able to do this as part of the briefing. But if we could ask, maybe in a request um, for clarity around if every family member is entitled to the hundred thousand that's being proposed, or if it's one hundred thousand per family, if that makes sense, because it's not clear um, at this stage. Um, and he may wish to, to talk about that more as part of the briefing, but just to maybe point that out to him because it would be good to get that um, information. Can I just ask for the process and that? What, what, what's if the, the minister is writing to the executive to ask the executive to give approval for it to go back to Westminster to take the decision? Will that require something to go through the assembly that we will need to give a committee a um, view on? Is that the. Yes, Chair, it'll be a legislative okay. consent motion. Okay. So the, the minister has written to the executive to request that um, 
its approval that it be included in the UK bill yeah. and UK legislation. So once that clause is inserted, then it comes back to us as a legislative consent motion. Okay. And at that stage, we undertake a, albeit shortened, period of, of consideration. But it will, will come back to us in a formal legislative consent motion, which will go before the Assembly for approval. Just the only point on that is that uh, just anything that we do, as long as it doesn't delay it, if it's going to get four party approval in the executive, and I can tell you now that we would approve and agree with that going there, you don't want it maybe to be held up by another three or four weeks whilst we slot it into our work to get a briefing on something that we all agree with. But if, it, if, it, if there's an opportunity to explore the issue and raise it, I would agree, but don't want to hold it up any longer for no. those people. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, members. Members, I know at the start we said about maybe a quick short comfort break. Do you want to do that now before the next briefing? Because there are probably two in one, or do you want to wait? Go another one, maybe. Okay. I'm, I'm lucky <laughs> you, Carl. I know you were you were very keen for that. <laughs> my kidneys are okay at the moment, but I don't know about the end of the next one. It might be helpful for the next one because whenever we have the, um, the yeah. GPs in and the ones after, we actually might get questions. Yeah, after no, that's, last, that's, that's fair enough. No, I'm, I'm happy to, to hold off then. Okay, um, members, so um, item number eight then is the briefing from the Royal College of GPs and the BMA GP committee um, in relation to primary care. Um, and we have representatives to brief the committee of some of the key challenges that they're facing um, in general practice, which many of us will be acutely aware of. Um, so if we can refer members to the briefing papers from both organisations at tab number eight, pages 94 to 130 in your pack. Um, I would outline to members that the Royal College of GPs have provided members with an early sight of its report on a workforce fit for the future, um, but this is embargoed until the 16th of April, I just could re um, remind you of that. And we have one hour for a session. Um, so I would like that to, inv to welcome Dr. Alan Stout, who is the chairperson of the BMA GP committee, Dr. Francis O'Hagan, the Deputy Chairperson of the BMA GP Committee, Dr. Ursula Mason, the Chairperson of the RCGP, and Dr. Emma Murta, who is the Policy Lead for the RCGP. So you're all very welcome, and we thank you for your time um, for attending today. So if I could invite you to then um, make your remarks, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to start, if you're happy enough with that. And good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Chair, for, for giving us the opportunity to come before the Committee today to out update you on the current pressures uh, in general practice, and also to outline some of the areas where we really do need to find some solutions uh, to help us all to move forward. I do hope that I'll be able to finish on a positive note, but I need to be absolutely clear about the pressures that general practice is currently under, uh, and I know many of you are already aware of that. Uh, you've heard me and my colleagues say many times in different forums that the service is in crisis. Uh, and what that means in reality is that every day, uh, every GP across Northern Ireland faces huge pressures to see and to speak to patients, make sure results are followed up, uh, to make sure that paperwork is done, reports are completed, referrals are made, and to make sure that other staff members are actually able to do their jobs as well. Uh, our GPs face huge financial pressures in terms of not being able to meet the running costs of practice at the moment. And they're dealing with a workforce shortage head on every single day, uh, juggling gaps within practice, trying and often failing to secure locums to cover and often sacrificing their own annual leave to ensure some sort of practice continuity. Uh, and every day our GPs, we hear it every day, ask themselves, is this worth it? Uh, is the pressure that they themselves and their colleagues are facing as GPs in charge of people's health, the pressures as an employer uh, and also as a business owner and the huge impact that the job is having on their personal and their family lives? And they really do ask, is it, is it worth it? Uh, we face a relentless need for our services and we do our absolute utmost to see our patients in a timely way, give them the service that they deserve, but it is becoming increasingly difficult uh, and as you well know, mm. uh, many GPs are choosing to hand back their contracts because they just simply can't, uh, can't deliver the service anymore. The funding we've been given is inadequate. It's not kept pace with inflation and for many practices every month is a case of trying to juggle the finances to ensure all of the bills are covered. 
just like households we've faced increasing utility charges heat and light along with increased costs of consumables uh, in practice the funding model just needs to be reviewed uh, and to reflect the current financial reality the audit office report itself a couple of weeks ago uh, highlighted that the gp uh, element of the health service funding accounts for 5.4 percent which is an astonishing uh, low number uh, and we simply can't deliver more and more with less and less uh, patient numbers are increasing. The recent audit report also stated uh, a growth of 100,000, over 100,000 since 2014, and our population continues to grow uh, and are living longer. Uh, this increases the complexity, uh, and that needs a lot more time and intention in practice. The uneven rollout of MDTs has led to an inequity of service provision across Northern Ireland, and practices without an MDT are under even more pressure, uh, and the comparison is quite stark. Workforce, of course, remains a huge issue. We don't have enough GPs. We've seen a reduction in whole time equivalents of 136 th since 2014. And perhaps most worryingly, 500, nearly 500 of our current GPs are aged 55 and over, so uh, imminently uh, retiring and could be retiring at any point. We are nowhere near replacing them, uh, never mind expanding our, our numbers. And also to touch on the huge issues in secondary care, the unacceptable lengthy waiting list, you'll have heard about those many times, uh, but they have a massive impact on general practice as well. Uh, and even the simple act of having to tell patients that we will refer them, they need further treatment, but you'll have to wait years, uh, has a huge impact on the amount of times that they come back to us uh, and the pressure that that puts on us uh, is immense as well. So we have to address all of the issues health faces in a holistic way. We can't fix one bit and not the rest. Uh, and I did say I'll finish uh, on a positive. Uh, and I do want to just give you a very brief update on our current contract negotiations. Uh, we have just about reached an agreement with the department. There's a couple of T's to cross and I's to dot. Um, but the contract changes for GPs in Northern Ireland for next year. And I do want to put on record my thanks to our colleagues in the department and in SPPG for their work with us uh, on that. And these changes will hopefully achieve a degree of stability uh, of practices, but we are realistic that they will not achieve an overnight reversal uh, of the challenges that I've outlined. Uh, as part of this agreement, I'm also pleased to say that we have made some significant progress on GP indemnity. Uh, and most of you are aware that that has been a, a very significant problem for here for many years. So just to conclude, and I'm going to hand over to, to Ursula, but I am still convinced that with the right support, we can change and we can improve. But this is entirely dependent on everybody doing the right thing and us all making the right decisions. Uh, general practice not only is the bedrock of the NHS, but actually provides the foundation for so many of the solutions that you as a committee will hear and that we know that we require uh, into the future. Uh, and I know that Ursula is probably going to expand on that a little bit further. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon. Uh, we really welcome the opportunity to come and talk to you today and hopefully answer some of your questions. Um, I'm hopefully not going to repeat a huge amount of what Alan has said, but uh, we'll move in a slightly different direction. Our health service needs not just a general practice that's hanging on by a thread, not just a general practice that's being propped up or being supported to keep going. Our health service and our citizens need a well-resourced general practice that attracts and retains the highest quality doctors who can deliver for all at the heart of our communities. I'm going to try and focus on what good looks like and some steps that could help to achieve that. I'm hopefully not going to repeat much of what Alan has said, but his words are as stark as the challenges that we face every day. None more than the challenge of the impact of inequalities that exist for our population. The inverse care law states that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. Northern Ireland is the most deprived of the four UK nations, with approximately one in three people here living in the highest quintile for deprivation. We have some of the worst health outcomes, the highest demand for GP appointments and of course the longest waiting lists. While general practice has been facing sustained and unprecedented pressures across Northern Ireland, the manifestation of that inverse care law means that the practice is serving the most socio-economically deprived areas face compounded challenges. 
GPs working in those areas have higher list sizes, fewer GPs per weighted population and patients suffer more, reduced healthy life expectancy, premature mortality, poor mental health, increased suicide rates, I could go on. Recruitment into those practices is more difficult and there is a greater proportion of contract handbacks in areas of blanket deprivation. Alan's already also touched on the impact of the stalled MDT rollout on the inequalities that our patients and our practices are suffering. Investing to tackle health inequalities in our population makes so much sense. 95% of all health-related contacts in any patient's lifetime are provided by primary care, yet as we've heard, we're currently trying to do that um, and do it as well as we can with only 5.4% of the budget. It's not surprising we're in crisis and the Northern Ireland Audit Office report lays bare the deficiency and the impact. But what would good look like and what would it cost? Good quality effective care is built upon relationships and it is the continuity of those relationships and continuity of care that is key. The evidence for the benefit of continuity is both persuasive and it's growing. Good relationships lead to improved patient experience, better health outcomes and reduced mortality. For us as clinicians, it means greater job satisfaction, while for the wider health system, it means reduced costs from fewer prescriptions, fewer unplanned hospital admissions, more appropriate referrals and investigations, and a greater adherence to medical advice. But workload pressures in general practice are perhaps the largest obstacle to relationship-based <coughs> care. Fundamentally, we need to see a shift in the debate around GP access to emphasise quality as well as speed. Our workload and the issue of access is both <coughs> complex and interlinked, and you will heard, have heard of some of that from Alan earlier, but fundamentally, access at its core is directly linked to the, de the demand capacity equation. Currently, that equation is far from balanced, and I will not rehearse the reasons why, because I think you all know that. Put simply, there is not the workforce to deliver on the demand that currently exists. Extra phone lines and digital transformation will not go far enough to address the need for a clinician at the end of that to meet the tsunami of need that exists in our population. <coughs> Alan has outlined some statistics on workforce, but I wanted to touch on some of the negativity that surrounds the perception that GPs are only working part-time hours. As a result of the combination of a significant increase in our workload, its intensity, its case mix, the clinical risk and the increased complexity of the patients that we see a session in general practice today looks nothing like it did when I first started 20 years ago. I don't think I've ever heard any denigration of our hospital colleagues who don't spend all of their contracted hours giving direct <coughs> patient-facing care, but such denigration is commonplace and widespread when it comes to general practice. GPs are being vilified for working as part-timers when in fact a full day is often 12 hours long. So a GP working three days or six clinical sessions in practice is putting in more hours than what's considered full-time by our society's metrics. And that's before we keep up to date through educational activity, improve our practice systems, support and supervise the next generation of doctors and students, and run a business. Unlike our hospital colleagues, we have no protected time for this. Add that all together and that GP working three days a week is probably doing very well not to burn out. But burn out they are and burning out and needing to reduce work commitments at best or leaving our profession at worst. We must accept that unless the day job changes substantially, six clinical sessions is likely to be the norm for most full-time GPs to sustain a career that does not end prematurely. We must also accept that many GPs will work less than that, as is their right. Many will give back to the system and our society in other ways, and creating flexibility and support are key to making the job both attractive and sustainable. A workforce strategy for Northern Ireland general practice must include the expansion of GP training places to meet the growing gap and steps must be taken to retain our current workforce of highly skilled GPs. The last two years has seen the increase in training places to 121 and we very much welcome the Minister's commitment to this. However, the evidence <coughs> suggests that we need closer to 169 places and that leaves us deeply concerned about the shortfall which is growing. Despite the need for more places during the first round of recruitment in the last two years, Northern Ireland has failed to fill its 121 complement. 
This year, however, shows a slight improvement. In the first round of recruitment, which is just closed, there are 116 acceptances, um, with a small percentage attrition expected on the start date. That is most definitely an improvement, which is very positive. Not only do training numbers need to increase, but we need to continue to make general practice in Northern Ireland a more attractive career choice. There's a major demographic shift in the trainee makeup in recent years, with around 50% of last year's trainees coming from an international medical graduate background, a significant increase from a 9% level in 21-22. These doctors face additional challenges in securing health and care worker visas and have also the added burden of being new to Northern Ireland and new to the NHS. They are also, however, very much more mobile and are much less likely to remain in Northern Ireland following training, so more needs to be done to both welcome them and support them to stay. And that brings me to retention. You will all be aware that we are about to publish our retention strategy, a workforce fit for the future, setting out key retention challenges as identified by GPs here in Northern Ireland and proposing a number of short and medium term solutions. I'm not going to uh, outline the entire report today, you'll be pleased to know, um, but I will give you a short flavour. The current retention scheme in place is not fit for purpose and requires revision. The potential for this scheme to support GPs at all career stages is not being utilised and it is neither delivering for GPs nor practices. Early career GPs cite a need for enhanced support to allow them to grow and develop and become the partners of the future, the leaders of the future, and to enhance the skills and special interests that we know keep people working here in Northern Ireland. The current GP fellowship scheme has only four posts for a one-year period. In contrast, schemes across other parts of the UK are available on a much greater scale to support young GPs working as partners and salaried doctors in practice where weekly opportunities exist to further develop their career and their professional potential. Other areas include a focus on addressing the burden of workload in general practice that should be the responsibility of other parts of the system, ways to improve the efficiency and safety within general practice and the provision and support of, uh, and the provision of support for practices at risk of collapse. I commend our strategy to you, but only in the context of the need for increased long-term investment and a commitment to a properly funded and enacted workforce strategy, otherwise retention is futile. I will end with trying to find an answer to the last question I posed, what would good quality care cost? Clearly maintaining 5.4% of the overall budget will perpetuate the current crisis and we can neither afford nor risk whole scale collapse. Stabilisation will require investment, but working towards sustainable service that delivers for all of our citizens will likely need a doubling in percentage terms. For every £1 spent in the NHS as a whole, our society benefits from a £4 return into the economy. That same £1 invested into primary care offers a £14 in economic growth. You will never get a safer bet when it comes to healthcare investment. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, that, that has certainly been very, very informative um, and probably answers a lot of the questions that we were planning to ask. Anyhow, I, I'll start with a couple um, before opening up to members and some of it you may not be able to answer. I'm very conscious now that the negotiations, um, Alan, you've said, are are hopefully coming to, to an almost concluding point. So I appreciate that you may be, maybe not be able to give too much detail. Um, I suppose l l going to to Ursula's closing remarks there, um, you know, across every briefing and every conversation we've had to date, and in the committee, is looking at workforce right across our whole health and social care, um, service, and I I think w how you've described what what it needs to happen, has been very very good for us to hear of what because it's it's to the point, um, and it's it's not, uh, too difficult to understand. So, based on. What you've in, in your discussions with the department with the minister to date, do you feel without maybe haven't gone into the detail of that, that what you're hearing will go some way to help to to achieve some of what you're talking about here in terms of workforce recruitment, but retention most importantly, um, to improve that quality of service that we're talking about. Can I take that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, from a recruitment potential, I suppose one of the really positive things was that um, in discussions um, with the minister both previously and, and most recently, um, he does understand that there is a real need to increase the number of training places in Northern Ireland, um, and he did make that commitment, which I say we, we very much welcome. Um, there is a continued challenge across the UK to recruit trainee doctors into training posts, and, and that so, so the issues with Northern Ireland recruitment and general practice mm -hmm are not isolated. Um, the fact that that increase has been made is in recognition of the need to push those numbers up. 
But I suppose the fundamental problem is that we are stalled at 121. The need to get to 160 should probably look like a more incremental increase 10 on year, year on year. It is simply not possible to suddenly turn around to our training organisation and say next year we've decided you can have 160, off you go and train them. We do need to look at an incremental increase because each of those doctors has to be placed into a training scheme um, and they have to spend you know, 18 months of their training in a general practice. So we need to make sure that we have capacity to train the doctors of the future. But that commitment, um, there certainly has been some positive discussions with the minister. That agreement to stick at 121 has been hugely positive when we've seen other training places being cut. But the fundamental sort of need for that increase still remains. So unless we see a decision that takes us beyond 121 and a change in that sort of feeling that general practice is a really good job to mm -hmm. come into. Um, and we all sit here today as GPs who really enjoy our jobs, despite the challenges that we talk about. Um, and we need to make sure that the doctors of the future understand that. The other key thing that's playing into that is the increase in medical student training in general practice. So Queen's and Ulster University now have a significant proportion of the undergraduate curriculum that exists um, in terms of education and practice. So our doctors of the future are seeing what it's like to be a GP that's a hugely positive experience for them and hopefully we will reap the dividends for that in terms of people who are you know going through training who want to become a GP you can't be what you can't see yeah. but we also need to make sure that it is a really good place and it, it is an attractive job so we could increase the numbers tomorrow we will almost certainly not fill them if we sit the way we are at the moment in terms of what general practice is currently like just to add to that as well, and, and Ursula is covered with three categories, three main categories of, of doctors, of GPs, the young ones, and Ursula has covered that very well. It's, it, it's one thing training them, but keeping them, and we've got a worldwide market, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a really competitive worldwide market. Australia, uh, Canada are attracting them. The American Medical Association have recently said they need 35,000 more doctors and have, have released all of their entry requirements uh, to, to help uh, them attract them. So we, we are part of that competition and we have to keep our doctors. But the other two big categories, one we've been very successful with, uh, or moderately successful with, I won't do over-exaggerate, but is pensions and our retiring doctors. Uh, and only earlier today we were talking about the pension flexibilities. So in other words, we don't lose 100% of a doctor uh, if we can allow them to retire and maybe still work part-time in practice. And it comes back to the part-time uh, discussion as well. That is a benefit to us and, and we do still keep part of the workforce as opposed to lose them completely. But the group that we're most worried about, um, because we tend to focus on the young doctors and on the retiring doctors, but it's the ones in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what terrifies all of us the most, uh, because they're the ones that we hear from and they're the ones that feel trapped. Uh, and that's where we have to give them a system and a working environment uh, that is safe uh, and is actually satisfying for them. Uh, and, uh, and what we hear from them is, uh, is very, very concerning. Yeah, and, and you've, you've kind of touched on my what I was going to ask then on the back of what Arsha said. We could increase the places to 200, yeah. but if we don't get to keep those 200, then we're, they're not really a benefit to us. So that, that's kind of where I was going to come at it as well, Alan, because retention, and it's across every yeah. um, work sector in, in the health service, that that's the, the, the quandary we're in. So I suppose around... The, the conditions that the, the, you talked about the flexibility for you know within the the, the, the job role itself and um, thinking of you know doctors with young families you, you talk about the workload pressure and that work-life balance all of that has to be taken into consideration if we want to firstly attract them but also keep them um, and, and improve that quality of service just I suppose um, very very quickly on the indemnity scheme and I know you've talked about th that has progressed and I'm really really glad to hear that are you at a point where you could say what type of an indemnity scheme you'd like to see? Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's there's lots of options. So what we want to see is a crown indemnity scheme, a state-backed indemnity scheme, which is similar to England and Wales. Scotland have a slightly different scheme where they are very much based on what their risk is and hence it's much less less cost to the individual. Um, the the way to so that needs uh, we understand primary legislation. Um, it certainly needs uh, a big political drive to achieve that and, and we're not there yet so there is a time delay with that even though there's been a, 
a seven year time delay already with it. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest way to solve it in the short term is simply to reimburse the current costs that our GPs are exposed to. Um, and again, I don't think it's any secret that that, that will be the short term solution and, and we would very much welcome that um, with a commitment to working to that long term solution as well. Yeah. Okay, no, that's 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 fair enough. The last question, just be be double faceted, I suppose. Um, in relation to you mentioned the contract handback, the no in my own area, we've seen that happening, unfortunately. Um, are we are we on the brink of an imminent wave of a, a, a lot of contract handbacks? And sec my second part of my question, rather than going back and forth, um, I, we're also seeing some hybrid models developing, which. For me, has um, you know, I would have concerns around as well. I can understand the rationale, but at the same time, I'm very conscious that this will potentially eat into um, NHS access for our patients, and it is generally then um, we're, we're we're working towards a two tier yeah. um, system very rapidly. Um, you know, can you give any commentary around that and and the impact on patient access? I don't want to put you in a difficult position, but no, 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 it's no, something no. that we're hearing every day. My office is being contacted by people who can't. Get through to their GP, and I very much take on board Ursula what you've said there around that vilific vilification of GPs because it, people don't really see what exactly you've just described to us. We're hearing it because we're embedded in this, um, in terms of our work and and the, and the health committee. But it's very difficult for people on the outside who who really need um, assistance at that time. So I hope I haven't added too much in there. The no, no, no. Uh, I mean, I'll pick it up and I'll, then I'll maybe pass to Francis because it's her area, her particular area, is where uh, we have a real fear of contract handbacks as well. But to answer your your the second part of your question, I mean, I can give you an absolute hundred percent reassurance that we are fully committed to making sure that we have a. A national health service that is free at the point of uh, of contact, free at the point of need for our patients, uh, and part of our strategy is not looking at alternatives. The the what you refer to, uh, and and I would not uh, talk it down in in any make shape or form because that is a desperate attempt to maintain an NHS service for the most possibly the most deprived part uh, of the entire united kingdom if not all of europe uh, and a practice that is in real crisis that is going above and beyond to try and maintain uh, a service an nhs service to that the easy thing for them to do would have been to hand their contract mm -hmm. back um, and what they have done is stepped in with an alternative um, to uh, to try and maintain that service and that just simply highlights how difficult uh, it is for us at the moment before I hand over to Francis I mean just in terms of contract handbacks because do not underestimate for a second how difficult that is for GPs to do that yeah. these these are small businesses they come with a cost uh, not only a financial cost but a really significant personal cost and whenever we speak to the GPs involved they feel that they've let themselves down they feel that they've let their patients <laughs> down and they feel like they've let their staff down so it is not a decision that is ever taken lightly uh, and it is not a position that I ever in all of my time as a doctor or as all of my time as a as a representative that I ever thought I would see this happen, uh, and it, again it highlights to me loud and clear just how difficult the environment has become. Uh, but Francis can elaborate on. Well, the southern area is my patch, um, so yes, the, we are still at risk of handbacks. Um, a handback will happen. If one of two things happens. One, they don't have enough funding to keep the business going, so there's no money to keep the doors open. Or the other is that they don't have um, the GPs to run the service. That can happen as a result of a few things. Um, and one that very often triggers it is a retirement, because usually the senior partner is the one that holds it all together, does a lot of the business work. And then, if you, the, the, as Alan described, the doctors in the middle then panic. Um, and it can be very difficult for them to try and support them. I, in my role as, as Southern Chair, um, get phone calls every day from practices that are worried about you know, different aspects of their practices and how they'll keep going. None of them want to hand back, not a single one. The moral injury is horrendous. Um, I, as Alan said, you know, in my time, I'm 30 years a GP, um, so I'm one of those ones who are heading towards retirement. Um, I have never seen this level of queries. I've, I've been an LMC officer for 20 years. And you might have had one query a year, now you have one a week, and, and that's just in our area. Um, so the, the other thing then that happens is the, 
we talked about two models, but there's actually a third model is where the trust are holding some of the contracts. And that is not something, certainly our trust doesn't want to be doing it. Mm -hmm. They say very clearly they are not the best people to do it. Um, But in a crisis, something has to happen. But the difficulty there that those practices are then being run by locums. So um, you get a different person in every day. Um, We said earlier that we love our jobs and I feel very privileged. I, I do love my job. But part of my big part of my job is that I know my patients and I take them from the cradle to the grave. That is a huge privilege. I don't underestimate that. People will let me into their lives and do that. Um, and that is why it is the best, well, I consider it to be the best uh, job in medicine. Um, but if you have different people coming in every day, you have nobody to follow people up. You don't, you don't know the patients. You know, that's where you get increased risk. And you're not there to follow up, you know, if you've done bloods or whatever, and go back and see, you know, what has happened. You, you know, that's not there. Mm-hmm. So the, that is a hugely risky model. Uh, and I'm sure you will have heard, um, you know, in practices in the southern area where that, that is happening. Yeah. Can I just add to that? Um, I think we also must take account of the fact that, you know, across the healthcare system, the vast majority of individuals who work in the NHS work as salaried individuals. And because general practice is different uh, and we work within the independent contractor model, by and large, although now we're seeing these other different models of of care delivery because born out of necessity through these contract handbacks, we have to look at well what is good value and and you know again I'm going to come back to well what is the value of general practice? The value of general practice is just as Francis has described what we do day and daily within small businesses that are, that are flexible and innovative and meet the needs of our population um, and the communities that we serve. The cost to the system for alternative models is greater than the cost of funding good quality independent contractor general practice. We know that there is evidence to suggest that trust run practices, certainly in in Wales, are costing about 33% more than actually running a practice. Mm -hmm. So none of this makes good economic sense. Mm -hmm. But we've got to get beyond the crisis. And and Alan has described and Francis is describing in, in, in her patch what that's currently looking like. Something needs to break that cycle um, and that needs to give general practitioners who are working in these practices, worrying about whether or not they have to hand back the contract, they need hope. And at the moment that is in really short supply because there isn't light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Everyone's holding on and hanging on, but I'm not sure how much longer they can hang on without the need to see, well, what, what will the future look like? What will investment in general practice look like? What is the value that our society is going to put on general practice? Because it won't take much to keep us going. Um, We are a very resilient part of the NHS, um, but we need something. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. It's about trying to create hope um, for those really hardworking GPs up and down the country. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I I take your point. I suppose that what I was trying to draw out there is that if we can get the funding right, um, we can resolve so many of these issues in terms of the hybrid model I, I alluded to. You, um, you'd mentioned then, you know, we're having to have locums. Like we know the huge cost of that, I think. And and you can understand why people choose to, to do that as well because of the kind of a better work-life balance. It's potentially better um, income and all of those other things as opposed to working in a very, very highly pressured um, situation that you've all described so I think for us to take away from that we see, we see what you're saying that it needs the proper investment to stabilise the service but also improve the quality and also improve the conditions and the work life balance that, that for GPs who as you say have loved their job because we've come a long way from the GP that used to come out and your family doctor I can even remember it myself as a child we had the same doctor right through all of our generations until he retired and, and passed away so that's the system we would like to probably get back to. Um, maybe it's slightly different, but um, I think that's what benefits all our patients and and those working in the sector. So I think that's the evidence important. shows that um, the right level of investment is between eleven and twelve percent. Yeah. So we're running on half the investment, um, and it's investment. We're not asking for pay rises for GPs. We're talking about investment into our the businesses service. so yeah. that we can employ enough people to do this work. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that will then have far-reaching benefits into the. The secondary care and, and emergency department pressures and all of those things that it are all interlinked so thank you i have linda and then Orlea. 
thank you very much. And a lot of what, what I, I was going to ask has, has been covered, so I'm not going to go over what has already been answered. I am glad to hear because indemnity, as you know, will, is one of the issues that was raised with me by everybody. Not because it's going to fix everything, because far from it. But it just gives people a wee bit of hope that at least they're being listened to, that somebody actually acknowledges the challenges that you have. And it's just a, a small recognition, and sometimes that can go a long, long way. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, I also want to place on the record that I know that a lot of people have a lot of issues around GP access. And sometimes that comes from the, the issues that you've, you've actually outlined there, Francis, around that locums and a different person every time you go in. And the frustration of that we know what it's like when you go into hospitals and you see a different person every time and you have to repeat your story and that's frustrating but when it's your own gp that's really difficult and actually people feel like they're not being seen and they're not being heard just because they're not seeing the same person and not building that relationship so i think that that's a, that's a massive challenge so sometimes it's almost perception and it's, it's in your head rather than a reality i know that but sometimes it is a reality sometimes access is an actual reality and and it's and it's not through the fault necessarily of GPs themselves, but, but that they have nowhere to send that person. So they know that that person is looking for an appointment to come back to see them, but they have nowhere to send them on to. So suppose what I, what I want us to maybe get to the bottom of is what could we do really quickly, or what could the department rather, but us lobby the department to do really quickly that would make a difference to that, you know, to, to that element, that access, accessibility and I know it's not a one answer I get that and maybe you have covered some of it so I don't want to force you to go over it again but is there something that we could do and is the answer the MDTs if it's not I'd like to know yeah um, well I'll pick up on that first you'll, you'll get lots of different answers but um, it, it is staff I mean I would say it is generically a staff the the absolute ideal answer to your question is GPs uh, you know and, and whenever we if you go to any practice and say what do you need they say in another GP uh, it's as simple as that but if we can't get another GP other staff are vitally important uh, and that does spread the uh, spread the load quite considerably um, now what can happen then is you make sure that the right patient goes to the right person um, but that's not I mean the critical part of MDTs is not just how it functions within general practice and this is my greatest frustration some of you have heard me say this already uh, because MDTs are what, seven years eight years maybe into fruition and we still have them only kind of covering a tiny proportion uh, of our population. Uh, Colin, actually, we met in, in one of the areas that is the exemplar, uh, and it, I mean, it, it blew my mind how well practice can work, and I should know, uh, and that's, you know, whenever you have a fully-fledged MDT. But my greatest frustration is that our conversation at this particular point in time should not be about how do we get MDTs to every practice? It should be, what does a bigger and better MDT look like? Um, because when you look at the pressures right throughout the system, and if you focus particularly on hospital discharges and hospital flow, we should have a really strong functioning MDT in general practice in primary in the primary care environment that not only helps keep people out of hospital but helps get people out of hospital whenever they're in hospital uh, and that's where the sticking point comes over and over and over with that and that's why we say that the solutions in primary care solve so many of the problems in the rest of the system and again another example only yesterday was the announcement of the vasectomy service don't focus on vasectomy as a single entity the principle behind that of delivering more in the primary care environment upskilling people in the primary care environment which then uh, lo and behold takes thousands literally thousands of people off waiting lists um, but what we do instinctively as a system is we knee jerk and we spend all our money, put all our resource and all of our staff into, into the hospital environment, put people, staff funding where we want, actually want our patients to be, which is out in the communities. I'll follow up with that by thinking about the people, because as Alan says, you know, it really needs people to improve access, 
but it's not the sole part of that. Um, as I said, there's lots and lots of different variables that impact on access and demand is the biggest driver for not being able to get to see your GP. So I know that all our patients feel very frustrated when they're either can't get through on the phones or end up number 27 in the queue or whatever that might be. And when they get to the end of that, they're told there are no more appointments left. For me as a GP, that's actually really hugely disappointing and, and almost to the point of, well, I can't physically do any more. GPs are burning mm. out, seeing more and more and more, and it's becoming riskier. And yes, MDTs will be a help because it creates another outlet for first contract contact practitioners to see patients when they need it at right place right time back in the communities but it will not negate the need for more gps and one of the things that we need to move away from um, is that feeling that mdts are the sole answer the silver bullet they are not they will absolutely stabilize a practice and, and where we see contract handbacks and a trust taking over a practice the first thing they do is put in an mdt now some of that is because they maybe can't recruit a gp and they have to get another body as alan says but mdts will improve and sustain and support practices and grow a wider team that delivers better care for patients but they are not the answer to the crisis in general practice um, they are the answer to creating equitable care for our population um, and that sustainability. The other thing I just wanted to touch on is that the demand that we have is growing and that's for lots of different reasons that I've outlined. We need to improve how our population sees what general practice does and the job of a GP. Quite often we're dealing with things that are not best placed for us to deal with but there's nowhere else in the system to do that. We are taking work or getting work from secondary care where we're, again we're not best placed to deal with it but it lands on our doorstep and there's no one else to do it and we are those and i mean if there's no one else to do it gps will just say well i'll do my best I'll, and, and, and we are almost um you know creating a rod to beat our own backs with because we try to help and support our patients that's what we do so the difficulty is that whenever it is something that we cannot do or we are overwhelmed with all the stuff that we absolutely need to do it all backs up and we don't have waiting lists we have that 8.30 in the morning scramble for the appointments that our patients really hate and we really hate it. So we need to move beyond that. We also need to improve how our population deals with ill health, the acute stuff, the urgent stuff that maybe doesn't need to see us, that could be seen by a pharmacist or some online help and support or something like that. So we need to utilise technology, we absolutely do, but none of that will make any difference if there are not enough GPs in surgeries in communities seeing patients when they need seeing. Can I pick up on something Ursula had said? Sorry, um, Chair. It just, Ursula had mentioned about burnout. We've talked about resilience. The health service is so resilient. I mean, I mean, I suppose I've worked with healthcare workers all my life and, you know, we are, you know, by, by definition, that, that's what we are. But we get sick too and we're patients too. And we forget that. Um, I think our patients forget that. But, but we forget that. And that's probably much more important. And certainly, we, I mean, in our CGP, we did a, a survey in 2022, and 40% of, of the GPs who responded said that they had had poor mental health in, the, in the, the three months prior to the survey. And a third had said that they were so stressed that they couldn't cope on at least three days of the week. So, you know, we, we have to be well to look, after, mm -hmm. to look after and serve our patients. And this isn't just for GPs, this is for everyone, all, all healthcare professionals. I know there's lots around the table. And I also think, you know, certainly it's easy to say, don't look at the comments on Belfast Live, but it's not so easy to do. And we're probably all the same in our jobs that everything that we do, there's a commentary about it. And it's not always positive. In fact, it's always negative. And that really is very injurious to us. I have known like GPs are, are facing so you know we have such high levels of moral distress. The eight thirty, you know, queue for calls that that really affects us. Every time a patient says it took me six hundred times to get through this week, that really upsets me because that's not the care that we want to provide, and it's it's hard to overstate the difficulties that that does cause us, and we are seeing people burning out. The, the audit office report last week um, showed. A 10% loss of the performers list in 22-23. Yeah, there were people of over 55 who left, certainly, but the most worrying thing to us was the young and mid-career, the, the increase in those GPs who were leaving. They're, they're leaving quietly. They're not filling in a form. We're not employees, so we don't do an exit interview. No, nobody knows why they're leaving, but we know why they're leaving. Mm -hmm. And it's because, it's just because of the severe difficulties. So 
I think one of the things in Northern Ireland, we, we are the only one of the, you know, of these Isles who don't have a practitioner health scheme. And um, certainly for, for the practitioner health scheme in, in England and Scotland, in one year they had 6,000 referrals. Most of them were doctors, 40% were GPs. And one third of the people who referred had had suicidal thoughts in the three months prior to referral. And we don't have that support. And certainly we have our own GPs, but as you can imagine, it's, it's difficult for healthcare workers to seek help from people who they know and may have, have worked with. I'm a GP trainer, I'm a programme director, lots of the young GPs, I have trained them, I have taught them, so it would be very difficult for me to, to go into a GP practice and, and admit that I have you know, a, a mental health issue or an addiction issue. Um, and also we need specialist we need specialists in treating healthcare workers. Um, that is a specialism in itself. So one of our, you know, one of our asks is that the department would fund a practitioner health scheme, and that's not just for GPs; that's for all healthcare workers. I think that uh, would really a, help. And a final point on what Emma says, because what what she says is so so important. Um, but we, when we talk about access, and and we are culpable for some of the reduced access because we brought out a safety paper. Uh, we were forced into bringing out a safety paper to try and protect our colleagues and say you have to limit what you're trying to do in a day because what you are trying to do is unsafe for your patients and for you and for your mental health. Uh, we wanted to, to have it as a as a discussion and a collaboration but the pressures were so great that we had to give our colleagues permission to say you can reduce what you're doing and not uh, not put yourself uh, it, it is not their responsibility their individual responsibility to make up for the shortfall mm -hmm. the historical shortfall that we've seen in workforce and in funding yeah, I, I think that's a fair point and I appreciate the answers I'm always afraid to say that I, I think I'm one of the very very lucky people that um, I have absolutely no complaints about my GP mm. surgery but that's because they do what you've told them not to do because I've got phone calls at half seven night giving me blood results and I'm thinking what are you doing now seriously mm -hmm. but that's the only time they have to do that so which is not fair because they have families of their own and they, and they should be able to have lives and do what you said they need to be able to look after their own health my final question is just um, and I'm glad I was actually glad to hear your point about the you know keeping people out of hospital but also helping people to get out of hospital because that's the conversation we've had at every single meeting is that we need to be able to get people out this is the final and, and it's just a, a one answer question really Pharmacy prescribers, is that going to help you in any significant way, do you think, them being prescribers and, and taking a wee bit of pressure off the, the GPs? Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a simple answer, which is yes, it will. I mean, anything like that will, will help. I think we've got to be really careful how we do it. There's a real temptation for solutions to look at other people doing things which become really expensive where actually it's far easier just to have it in a well-resourced well-staffed general practice uh, and we end up spending lots of money coming up with lots of alternative uh, solutions that that should have had just an easy solution many years ago thank you uh, Nula thank you chair um, and thank you very much um, for giving your evidence today and um, it's not the first time that I've have heard it um, and indeed um, many of us have met you um, just in our party capacities as well but I think it was important that we hear it today at the health committee particularly in open session so that the public and the department are aware of just how difficult things are. Um, as elected members one of the issues that does come up and has already been raised is that access to GP services and I had a few questions and one of them is around particularly um, that um, issue um, and I wanted to just further explore the GP access working group and your views as to regards as whether it's actually working is it helpful are you being listened to um, and your general I'll just say general views on it you start, you start. Okay. Um, so we, we, we all um, with the exception of Emma um, have been a part of the access working group um, and I think it goes without saying that it is really important that we look at access um, and as I said it is a direct consequence of the demand capacity mismatch so there's not one simple way to fix access and we need to look at this in a multifaceted way um, and the access group 
is started by primarily looking at how we could use digital solutions um, to support GP access. Um, and I suppose as a clinician, while I recognise that that is a really important thing, and I've already articulated that, um, we need to actually still consider that it is not, again, a one-size-fits-all and a single thing that will actually solve the problem of access. The problem of access will not be solved through digitisation. It may be um, enhanced and supported through improved digital solutions. And certainly from a general practice perspective, we do need to make sure that we are digitally capable um, and that we have equity of digital capabilities right across GP practices. So the fact that I can text my patients to say, you need a blood test follow up click the link and book directly you don't have to phone reception and sit in the queue that's a really important thing that support supports access the fact that i can send a text message to say we're about to start our COVID clinics here's the link to click directly in those kind of things are really helpful but that type of digitization or even the education through digital sort of uses will not solve access it will support fundamentally access will not be solved without individual bodies to meet the needs of our patients and I think I've said that quite a number of times. The group will also or is, is also looking at well, what is good quality, what does good look like, so what am I doing in my practice that might be good that I could share with Alan's practice that they could do, what are you doing that we could do, how can we share that across and how can we actually develop supporting practices to deliver good access um, and to make sure that you know that we are all doing a similar thing because one of the other things that a lot of you will be aware of is that the service that you get in your GP practice is free at the point of need and free at the point of contact but how you book your appointments the kind of person you see when you see them how it's all slightly different and all very nuanced and um, you might have an MDT so your back pain will go straight to the first contact physio you might not have an MDT and you might wait. So there's access is variable, but we need to make sure that where we can standardise it, we are doing that to the best of our abilities. I think the access group needs to look more around that um, and consider how we can support practices. Because as we've heard, there are lots of practices in crisis. One of the first things you do when your practice is in crisis is you pull in and you only do what you can possibly do. And Alan's again articulated what those practices are doing to try and maintain what they have in terms of staff. <laughs> If we can support our practices through, um, you know, the, 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 there is a crisis response and uh, quality and improvement team, which again could go in to help support how the systems are in place, what we're doing at practice level to improve and support access, bearing in mind that you only have so many bodies on the ground at any one point in time. There are things that we could do and the access group can and are supporting, moving and working in that direction. So. It is definitely an evolutionary group. We are looking at that twin track approach, um, and I think you know we need to do both together. Yeah, and I mean, just really simple. I agree with what Ursula is saying. The answer to access is not to create a fancier queue. Uh, you've got to have people there to to deal uh, with the queue. Um, and we have a disconnect, and I I, do, I don't mean to to demean it for a second. Um, because it is important, it's going to be important in the medium to long term. It's not going to be a solution in the short term um, because it will work in the medium to long term with increased uh, staffing levels uh, and increased GP levels. We have this bizarre disconnect between practices uh, and strategy uh, where practices are trying to reduce their access on occasions because they simply can't cope. Um, and, uh, and if we come to them with ideas for how we can improve the access to the practice, I think we'll just see an accelerated closure of the practices, unfortunately. I can imagine the response would be. Yeah, I think yeah. it's worth actually calling out a few statistics because we have less GP sessions now than we had before the pandemic, um, but we are providing more appointments. So appointments with GPs are at a level of 200,000 per week with 20,000 per day face-to-face -face in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think those are powerful statistics. They are higher than what we were pre-pandemic, so we are doing more with less. Um, and if you compare that to people who interact, as was said earlier, with um, the UK figures show there's 1.3 million GP appointments every day, but 67,000 people go to ED on the same day. So we are doing a huge amount of work. Um, 
and the problem is the demand has gone up and it, it, there is something about um, as, as Ursula was mentioning earlier just actually educating um, or even allowing our, our receptions are very good receptions to educate people if they come through to us and for example they need a social worker well they don't need us you know so take the advice from the receptions we'll get we'll direct you in the, in the way we can um, so it's it's you know getting that message out to the public that you may not actually need to see a GP you know there are other people and there are other ways that you can get you know your outcome achieved and I and I understand that we actually have had an event here in, in Stormont regarding uh, one of the aspects looking at um, waiting lists and waiting well and um, how whenever people are waiting for those um, appointments that they're often just turning to their GP to manage the symptoms of of those problems so we do appreciate that there is a, a massive issue with regards to waiting lists it's not just waiting lists for hospital access it's actually putting pressure on GP so we do understand that that issue needs um, fixed and with regards back to the first question around that digitization um, uh, I just I got the feeling from you or that the sense that it was digitization is being pushed as, as, as the solution or a key aspect of the solution and one of the things that we were looking at recently was the Encompass program um, and I just wanted to touch if any of your members has um, have, have fed any feedback regarding the, the, the platform of them being able to actually view um, the, the Encompass or Epic platform, I can't remember the, the name of it, um, just be interesting to hear if you've had any um, feedback regarding that and if they feel that it, it's kind of working at the minute and of course it won't be smooth sailing initially but yeah. it'll be interesting to hear any feedback. So, so for general practice, the, the Encompass program is slightly strange because we have been fully computerized for many, many years and have a very mature system and actually a system that is, is actually getting better and better in terms of data extraction and particularly when we start to look at population health. So actually the general practice IT system uh, is, I suspect, um, now I know uh, you're going to have other speakers shortly and, and they'll tell you better than I could um, but I suspect will will always be the absolute key uh, factor in terms of population health it is the it is the entire patient record and um, so we would see it as secondary care trying to catch up with with general practice and um, we've we were big fans of ECR uh, and where we could simply go in and, and look um, so I'm not sure that that encompasses had a big uh, effect or a big impact in general practice uh, at, at all? I mean, I think, so I suppose thinking about that initial part of the question about, you know, digitisation being pushed, I think I think it's really important that we all are digitally enabled in today's society. I mean, the vast majority of our patients are, they interact using digital forms of communication and we do need to make sure that we have systems in place that meet the needs of our population, mm -hmm. bearing in mind that also that we have a significant proportion who don't and can't, they're not digitally enabled, so we need in general practice and across the health system as a whole to make sure that we don't allow those patients to miss out and get an inequitable degree of care as a result of not being digitally enabled. But from a, I suppose, a digital strategy, we need everything needs to sit and, and move along at the same rate. So we can't prioritise one over another. We need to make sure that everything is happening together. Um, and compass-wise, I suppose most of the GPs here, I, I mean, I can say that I have a login and I have logged in and I know what it looks like from an end user perspective in general practice. But that looks very different to using it in a hospital system. Mm -hmm. So my worry is that we had, as Alan said, very mature IT systems in general practice that had some degree of um, ability to see into the hospital system. Um, what I'm seeing at the moment as a very early user of the EPIC system is that it doesn't look and feel as good for me at this moment in time, bearing in mind I've had no education on how to do it and how to use it. I've just gone in to have a look. So for us in general practice, we will be challenged as all of the trusts move into Encompass because we will need to make sure that we're interfacing with that in a way that doesn't lead to information slipping through the net. And that is my my main worry. And um, we've already had a couple of instances in our, our practice sits um, on the boundary of two trust practices. It's a Belfast trust practice, but a third of our population interface with Southeastern Trust. So we have had some instances where information possibly hasn't come through in those early days, where there were teething problems, and of course that's going to happen. But those things need to be ironed out as this gets rolled out, and we need to make sure that that interface with general practice is as seamless 
um, and as user friendly as possible and that GPs again and I'll come back to the fact that you know lots of our trust colleagues are going through training at the moment they are getting supported through the change general practice are given some logins and you can log into uh, a YouTube video if you want and um, off you go and do that in your own time we need to make sure that our GPs and our you know GP staff are as an enabled as possible to make sure that that transition allows for <coughs> safe patient care. Thank you. That's actually quite helpful. We had an informal briefing um, a few days ago around Encompass, so it's interesting to hear just in terms of how you've been able to actually access it. And it's important that we can, because we're going to have further work that we can we can feed back. So keep in in touch for sure. And I want to go back to the GP indemnity as well, if you don't mind, just um, a bit further clarity around it and um, the minister has said um you know in previous questions that they have and the department has real reallocated funding from other areas of the gp budget to boost capacity in the service and mitigate demand and capacity pressures um and that included support for additional costs of indemnity um okay can i actually what does that actually look like as a gp and in, and how beneficial has that been i think it would just yeah, okay. I think it's helpful. So probably we can probably cover that off very quickly. That that was last year. That was part of the winter pressure scheme last year, what you're referring to or what you've read out. So that was to support increased capacity over the winter. Now the solution into this year will be slightly different to okay. that, uh, which will be more of a direct hopefully will be more of a direct yes. cost reimbursement. This answer was given in February, at the end of February. That's yeah. right. Um so it will not look like that. No, it'll be it'll be okay. slightly different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the solution for indemnity, um, I'm not going outside the the maintenance. It's a one year solution to allow us to negotiate a proper okay. solution. Mm -hmm. So we will be sitting down with the depart our department colleagues, um, as soon as we get this contract finished off and set the ground running to look at those and other issues that need to be changed for and for next year. Okay. Uh, Danny. You sure. Um, Thank you uh, again. I know we've met previously on uh, various other issues, um, and certainly with issues in East Antrim as well. I've been talking to GPs in the area, um, and the the deep commitment and dedication of GPs in the area, and right across all of the meetings, is very very clear um, to the patients and to the profession at large. So I, w I want to thank you and you know your group for everything that you do for that. Um, the contract changes, obviously very hard. glad to hear what you were saying today, uh, today's news just about the contract changes and hopefully that will bring some stability to general practice. Um, I was reading the <coughs> audit office report recently that said almost one in three GP practices have sought crisis support services in the last four years. 13 practices handed out their contracts or gave notice of doing so between March 2022 and March 2023 and 39 practices were assessed as being at risk as of March 2023. That's a full-blown crisis, you know, absolutely. Um, the scale of that is uh, absolutely shocking. Um, so I'm very glad to hear that hopefully there will be some stability now within the system. Um, the GP physiotherapy services yesterday uh, obviously was very, very good to hear, and that speaks to a move towards enhancing GP skills, uh, and that should encourage more GPs then to, to stay within the practice. Obviously, it's something that GPs want to be able to do to services that they want to offer, and it helps the waiting list side of things as well. It's good for patients, good for the service, and good for GPs. So very, very glad to hear that yesterday, and I hope to see more of that going forward. And we will be talking to the department about you know their plans, their plans for that. Very glad to hear about the indemnity uh, that there's progress there as well, and certainly that's something that everybody will be um, glad to hear. Two quick questions. What percentage of your workload, and we've talked about uh, the waiting lists again and again here, just what percentage of your workload is related to people on waiting lists and how does this impact your ability to deliver service? Uh, and the second one, if we don't intervene at this stage, what does general practice look like in five, ten years? You know, where, where are we here? Thank you. Okay, answer to the first question about 20%. Uh, it's it's impossible to quantify, but it is about 20%. Uh, yeah, would you know, and that comes in many, many different guises. So that is somebody who is in chronic pain, needing more and more medication, wanting the referral prioritized, uh, developing other conditions and, and so on. So you get this uh, chronic recycling. But actually, the even more worrying uh, part of, of the answer to that is how it self-perpetuates the problem itself. 
uh, and I took it upon myself. I've told maybe one or two of you this story before, but I took it upon myself to, to take a couple of patients in my own practice and look at what had actually happened with them. And these are patients... One is a patient who needs a gallbladder operation, needs their gallbladder out. Uh, and I look back and I realise that that one individual patient that everybody in the system knows what they need was currently sitting on five different waiting lists, had come in to see us on 17 occasions, had been in an ED department on five different occasions uh, and was waiting, actually waiting for an operation uh, and an ultrasound, which they'd already had, uh, in, in two different trusts. Uh, so it is quite astonishing and, and this is why you will hear me whenever uh, we hear the numbers on waiting lists, whenever the numbers on waiting lists are so great, mm -hmm. the system becomes chaotic uh, and that for every GP uh, and when it's your patient and they're coming back to see you and you start to look into it, you realise uh, just how chaotic uh, the system is. Um, so it, it, yeah. Uh, again, we we need to be far more definitive. But you're right. The, I mean, part of the the vasectomy and the extended elective care services in primary care, not only does that give those individual patients local service, quick, efficient, safe service, but by taking a number, quite a significant number of patients off the other waiting list, it actually frees capacity uh, for our excellent specialists to do what we want our excellent specialists to be doing. And it really boosts retention as well, because yeah. when we spoke to our ST3s, um, our, our most senior GP trainees who are about to, to, you know, to qualify as fully trained GPs, that was very important to them, that they had some other outlet uh, you know, to, to work within the health service, but and, and within general practice, but possibly just not within, you know, what we see as traditional general practice. So that, that really will keep yeah. people, that will keep people with I us. I going to elaborate a little bit on that 20% and I suspect it's per, it would be higher if we weren't perpetuating a two-tier system. Yeah. So um, in my practice, and I'm sure the same can be said for all four of us sitting here today, when you see a patient and they sit in front of you and you know you need to refer them, your heart sinks. Because if you're referring that patient onto a red flag pathway, you know that they're not going to be seen in two weeks. If you're referring them urgently, you know that they're not going to be seen this year. And if you're referring them routinely, they're probably never going to be seen in the current system unless we fix it. Now that is okay if the patient says the magic words, I would like to go private doctor because then you know that the conversation that you're about to have with the patient will change instantly because you're not going to have to deliver the really... We're, we deliver bad news all the time, but it's getting increasingly difficult that the bad news that we're delivering day and daily is not that you've got an awful diagnosis, is that you're going to sit on a waiting list and we won't know what your awful diagnosis is and that's going to get worse before you're seen. That is adding to the moral injury. I have spoken to GPs who one of the reasons that they are leaving general practice it, to go to work somewhere else is they can't actually deliver <coughs> care for the patients. They know they need their gallbladder out. They know they might have breast cancer. They know they might have colon cancer, but they simply cannot get them seen because that patient cannot, because of their circumstances, and they shouldn't have to because we have an NHS which is free at the point of need, they shouldn't have to go private. But the only way that mo much of the care is being delivered now is when our patient says, can you write me a private letter, doctor? I'm going home to speak to the family and they're going to raid the piggy banks to, to get me seen and sorted. It's just, it, it, it is morally distressing for us. But how awful is that for the patients that we are sitting in front of, that they have to feel that that's the only way that they can get care. So our, 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 the impact of waiting lists is so much greater, particularly because so many of our, our citizens are paying privately for something which for the vast majority of them, they've already paid for through their taxation. Okay. The, and, the, and actually, sorry, you have, because you did ask a second question, because it leads on directly from what Ursula has just said, is what does it look like if... if we don't change this round. And what actually happens, and what we can see at the moment, is we see a transactional illness service where we see a population becoming iller and iller and iller, and we lose all of the things that have to be 
absolutely fundamental to the future of our health service, which is that early intervention, that promotion, that education, mm. the health protection, uh, the continuity, all of which general practice delivers so well uh, and, and should be enabled to deliver better and better and better because that has the biggest impact. I mean, never mind £135 million in waiting lists, the mm. biggest impact we can have on the future health of our population uh, is that investment and that support for general practice. If the system could do today's work today, mm. our population would be so much healthier. Yeah. Yeah. But we are hamstrung because we have yesterdays and the day before and mm. the day before and the year before. And the real challenge is how do we actually fix that? Because we have to move forward where patients are not languishing the way they are at the moment because the system will collapse and it will collapse first in general practice. And it's also, it's also shown um, that it, what we are doing, we're not doing well, because if you look at the figures, um, so I live in the border area in Armagh, um, if I up sticks and moved 10 miles up the road and crossed the border, um, my husband would live four years longer and I would live seven years longer. That's the, that's the stark reality of, of, this is a very small island, mm -hmm. so what are we doing so wrong? I think that's something we, ha we have been discussing about the importance of that early intervention because if the sooner people are seen and we're not dealing with, you know, at the, at the very late stage when it's almost, it's too late, you yeah. know, and things have, conti have got worse by the time they're actually seen by who they need to see. My last person I have on my list is Alan Chambers. Thanks very much. So, um, I suppose as a public representative, okay. I've, I've two hats to wear. Um, first hat is to ensure uh, that we have a health service to serve the public um, and to appreciate the difficulties that you guys are having uh, and to do the utmost to improve and support everything that you're doing to improve the service that you offer to the public. I suppose the other hat then is, the, is representing the constituents uh, and you know, Ursula they're referred to uh, burnout of GPs that's a reality, and we must do everything that we can with duty of care to prevent that happening, but that is a real reality. But on the other side, we're in the other hat. The thing that worries me is patient burnout, that we could be creating um, a society who will take the attitude, oh well, I'll take my chances. What's, what's, what, why should I get on the phone and wait for hours and try to see a GP? Sure, I'll not get, I'll not get an appointment. And I'll take my chances. And that is, that's really bad. And so Dr. talks there about life expectancy. That's one of the success stories of the NHS, that over the years we've managed to increase the life expectancy of our public. Uh, but I think that there's a, and that success, by the way, starts with primary care. But it does worry me that, that the, our life expectancy figures will start to fall if people start to adopt that attitude of, ah, uh, I'll take my chance. But the, um, the couple of things are about, uh, you know, Ursula says you're dreading the 8.30 in the morning. I'm sure the staff, the receptionists must absolutely hate it in the morning because they're, they're, they're right at the, at the cold face. But just a couple of points around it. You're sitting 25th in the queue. Now, I'm not a, a technocrat, so I don't know whether there's easy solutions here. Um, maybe it's something I should go away and try and invent. But I'm sitting at 25 and I'm thinking, that's great. Now I'm 24 now. Oh, I'm 23. This is great. And you're getting closer to that magic number one and then you get the number one and you're told, sorry, with no slots. And I'm saying to myself, at what point was there no slots? Was it just the moment I rang there? Was I just out of luck? If I hadn't been two minutes earlier, would I have got a slot? Or was there no slots from when I was 25 in the queue? So there's some method of changing the recorded message at the point that the, the slots are all gone. It would maybe save a lot of resource for staff and a, a, a lot of for the patients as well. But the other thing I, I find, uh, you know, members of the public, I even have this difficulty myself trying to, 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 to work it around my working life. If I need to try and get an appointment with the GP, I mean, I've got to get on the phone from half past eight and I've got to be confident with my speed dialing and eventually get through and I might have to wait an hour and a half to be told there's no slots or whatever or if I'm lucky and they say yes you've got it you'll get a you'll get a call back so I've got to sit by my phone and wait for that that call back which I don't know when it's going to come uh, but it will come 
But if you if you're a working person, if you're if you're a retail worker or a school teacher, or how do you manage that? How do you how do you work that round your working day? Again, this could be an incentive for this culture to develop. Of I'll take my chance. So I'm just wondering, has there ever been any consideration given to um, out of office hours where you would create in the evenings, create a slot of time uh, that would be taking calls for slots for the next day? So the people who do have to go out, to, you know, who have a go to work and don't have the opportunity to speed dial and, and hang on the phone for a couple of hours, mm-hmm. that in an evening time, uh, that 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 they, they they that they could do it. Just wondering, has any consideration ever been given to that? Well, we used to run evening surgeries as well, but it, it, I mean, the bottom line is we can't actually staff during the day. Never mind uh, in the evening time. I, I, I think it's a really, really good question, really good point. If if it is the the final question, because uh, I think it sums up the discussion that we've had. We. And and there's lots and lots of solutions. There's lots and lots of good ideas. Uh, we're really struggling to to deliver them just simply because of the the shortage. And we're, <coughs> the best way to deliver them is for us to try and deliver them together uh, and working together. Uh, we can't do it without the politics, uh, and the politics means not only the political support, it means the political lobbying, it means the budget, it means the workforce, it means everything else that we've we've talked about. So, I mean, the answer to you is yes, I think you're you're coming up with really good ideas, but we actually need you to help. I think you're, you're a yeah, bigger, I'll put the other hat on. You're a bigger <laughs> part of the political solution on, uh, at this point. <laughs> from your point of view of accommodating people who are working, um, I speak for my practice in that we frequently take those phone calls at half eight in the morning and there's a rider underneath it saying in work until half three and work until one o'clock, please phone after. So we just skip them in the queue, go on down and come back up at the time slotted or you ring mummy and we Johnny need seen buddies in school. Um, that's OK, we'll give you a slot after half three. You know, there, there's I think plenty patients of maybe don't ways. know that. I think we're, you know, patients just so glad to get through and, and, and get, the, get, get a slot. But maybe, very maybe savvy if people knew that, that would help. <laughs> <laughs> people in your practice maybe know that you're accommodating like that. What you're explaining, though, is the variability that we talked about across the system, yeah. because each practice does what it can to meet its demand with, with the bodies that they have on the day. So some days it's a bit easier. Some days it's much more difficult. Some people use different digital solutions. So, for example, in our practice, you can book online for an appointment a week away. Um, now, there are only so many of them, but there are some of them. Um, so we are all doing what we can within our practices to meet the needs as best we can in a system that we know is in crisis. But your other point is really important about that, um, I suppose, feeling that our patients will often say, what's the point? And that's where we get to a really critically worrying scenario where we are missing diagnoses early, we are missing the opportunity for early intervention, for upstream prevention, and to really make a difference. Because if we think about that potential, and I know the question was like, well, what would happen if it all collapsed? We would get to a point where those figures that Francis has just articulated around the differences in life expectancy, it would get infinitely worse. And we would find ourselves actually not being able to meet any need there because we need a a fully functioning supported general practice that actually delivers for the patient who has that oh I've got a bit of a lump or my cough or maybe I need to talk to the doctor that's what we're good at not necessarily seeing a hundred sore throats not necessarily having to meet you know I need the social worker or I actually have a problem in a form that needs filled in but nobody else can fill it what general practice gives to the system is the ability to see all of those patients with those first presentations that might be something serious but might not knowing when to refer into hopefully a system that can deliver and knowing more importantly when not to refer to be able to reassure you that that really worrying thing in your mind it's okay because we have the skills and expertise to be able to do that the problem is we are completely hamstrung day and daily in dealing with all of the other stuff that the system is not letting us cut through to the really important person who's not picking up the phone because they can't get through. And that is the crux of where we need to get to. We need to get to a service that everybody feels they can lift the phone and it's there for them because currently it's not. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for your presentation and thank you for the work that you do. And um, 
I kind of view primary care at the moment as being maybe like a, a large lump of ice or with you here today, a nice sculpture. Um, but the bottom line is it's dripping. And day by day, it's just getting smaller and smaller. And whilst that might be the end of the questioning and we always like to end on a positive, I'm afraid we're going to have to end on a reality. And that reality is just to ask this question. If the department and this executive continues with the interventions that they've done to date and doesn't do anything else, is primary care going to collapse? Yes. Yeah, as simple as that. It, I mean, it, it cannot. I mean, again, I don't underplay that we, we've made progress with contract for next year, uh, and and as I say, our hope is that that is going to stabilise practices, but that it is not a magic bullet. It does not turn the whole thing around. It does not improve what we've talked about so much as in terms of access and patient experience and, and so on. It simply will keep our practices there to enable what you're suggesting, which is those next really, really significant steps, which are in workforce and are in resource and, and building that uh, that strong foundation. But current trajectory, oh, we're talking about 12 to 18 months maximum. I think, think the reality, I mean, as I said, and we know that 5.4% of the budget is not sufficient. We know that the evidence would suggest that you've got to get beyond that 10-12% um, to actually be able to provide a good, fully functioning, delivering primary care. And if you do that, then the health of our population gets better. So the trajectory that we're on at the moment will deliver nothing for our patients. Um, we need to actually turn the tide. And I appreciate that in conversations that we have all the time, the simple answer to that question is there isn't any money in the budget. There's no budget for that. And, and I suppose as a doctor, as a patient, as a constituent, I would say, well, there is a budget, but there is a decision to allocate 5.4% of that budget to primary care and the rest of it goes somewhere else. So as politicians, my ask on you is to, well, do we need to reallocate the budget? Do we need to refocus where that money needs to be spent? And I'll come back to my very last line. For every pound that you invest in the health service, you get four pounds back in economic growth. For every pound that goes into primary care, you get £14 back. We need to move the allocation, if it's fixed, to a primary care focus. We need to look at delivering health care through a primary care lens because the current lens is downstream when it all happens, when it all goes wrong. We cannot afford to keep doing that. Yeah. I think it's four very senior clinicians within primary care. You've just delivered us a very serious message that we need to carry back to the department, but thank you for that. Thank Remember you. our colleagues in the department that are coming on afterwards. We've been negotiating with them to get the best deal we can, but if the, if the department is only given them 5.4% of the budget, they can't, they can, we can only wriggle inside those. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. It needs to come from higher up so that the, the budget is devolved down so that they have a bigger budget to play with to be able to help us. Oh, absolutely, and I think this is what we have been saying. We're 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 working through symptom management all the time, um, and we need to be looking at it at the other end of the um, the lens, and and like how do we look at get it to that starting point where it needs to be focused on, so that we don't need it at the other end of the the scale, if that makes sense. So, listen, that that's been a very very comprehensive discussion. I think we have a lot to take away from it and um, we want to thank you for your time and um, we have run over slightly but it's been important to hear um, the depth of, of what you're facing but also the solutions that you've been able to to put um, in front of us that we can hopefully take back then to the Minister so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members we also have, an, we have another briefing as you know I'm going to propose we take a five minute mm -hmm. comfort break cause I'm, um, but I will be keeping it very very tight for the, for the remainder of our session. Okay. <laughs> I'm very fast. <laughs> Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, 
Signed. Committee Room 29. 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 Signed. On the next no, section. Okay. Um, we'll move to item number nine then, and it is the briefing from the Department for Health of Health um, officials on primary care. Um, and I'd like to welcome Gorod Cassidy, uh, Director of Primary Care, and Dr. Margaret O'Brien, who's Assistant De Director. Um, 
of the Head of General Medical Services. Members, just to refer you to your briefing paper at tab 9, page 131 of your pack, and also included in the pack at tab 9.2, page 153, is the NIAO, the Audit Office Report, um, which we have mentioned in the previous uh, briefing about access to general practice in Northern Ireland. And also in table papers at page 21 is the Minister's written statement of vasectomy services moving from secondary to primary care, which he announced yesterday. So um, I'd just like to, to open up to yourselves when you get a wee, a wee minute there um, thank you much. Thank you. to make your opening remarks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, and thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Garod um, Cassidy. And thank you for the opportunity to be here um, to brief the Committee on Primary Care. Um, I'm joined by Margaret O'Brien, who's the Head of General Medical Services from the FTPG Group within the Department. I'm myself, I'm the Director of Primary Care. Um, I'll be making some remarks on behalf of both of us. Um, we provided you with an overview paper on primary care prior to the meeting, which I hope you found helpful. Um, general practice is widely acknowledged as the bedrock of health and social care. As a first point of access, our GP is the healthcare professional that most of us will turn to for treatment, care and advice. However, as you'll be aware, primary care is facing ongoing challenges because of increasing demands for services, a changing GP workforce demographic, and some evidence suggests that despite increased GP numbers, the sessions being worked have not increased in line with previous working patterns. This is in the context of an aging population with increased numbers of people living with multimorbidities and complex conditions. Stabilisation of GP practices is a key concern for the department. Um, the number of contract handbacks over the past two years is testament to the pressures that many GPs and their teams are dealing with day and daily. The, departments, the SPPG and the department have worked hard to ensure that where contracts have been handed back, no practice is closed and patients have, continued to, have been able to continue to access GP services in their areas. However, it's recognised that we cannot continue with this situation where GPs are facing such sustained levels of pressure and where the potential for handbacks is an ongoing reality. Minister Swan has stated that primary care is one of his key priorities. The department has been continuing to work alongside GP representatives to ensure that general practice is sustainable for the long term. There is a range of work underway across primary care with the aim of ensuring people can continue to access high quality, sustainable services now and in the future. There's three strategic pillars to this work. Um, number one is improving the sustainability of primary care services. Number two is strengthening the primary care workforce. And number three is managing demand and improving access. <coughs> Further implementation of the MDT model has been identified as an important measure to stabilise GP practices and a key enabler of transformation in the primary care system. Plans are under development for the future rollout of the model subject to funding. Our aim is to have a primary care that is better designed to work for patients and more importantly, and importantly that is also better able to fulfil the aspirations of those who choose to make their career in general practice. The department has made significant investment to support general practice. Through the Department's Winter Pressures Plan, 3.4 million was made available to GMS and the NFR services to support capacity over the winter period. 4.3 million pounds was also made available to help GP practices deliver proactive support to, 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 and care to those in nursing and residential care homes. In addition, the Department is able to reallocate 2.7 million to help boost capacity. We have continued to boost capacity of primary care by investing £25 million per year in the primary care MDT programme, £19 million per year in the, the general practice pharmacy programme and £3.1 million to, to recruit advanced nurse practitioners. To support the GP workforce, the number of training places was increased by 121 to 221. We have also continued to work with representatives and other stakeholders in NIMDATA and universities to increase the exposure of undergraduates to general practice as part of their curriculum, encourage more GP trainees and ensure that there are sufficient GP training practices to meet demand and support GPs in training. As part of a whole systems approach, the Department has also established a primary and community care board with the aim of encouraging synergies to address strategic challenges in primary and community care services. The Department is also working alongside the NIGPC to have in place the GMS contract with this fit for future and as part of a longer term development of a, of a resilient general practice that works for patients and GPs and which better meets the, cha the changing environment and context in primary care. Thank you for the, for the opportunity to brief you today. Margaret and I are happy to explore these issues in some more detail. Thank you, uh, Groot, and thank you for the for the briefing provided as well, which has been very helpful. Um, I just have a couple of questions, and it will come on the back of what we've um, heard in our last briefing as well. Um, and you've talked about some of the plans around, you know, the, the need to increase GP training places. Um, you will have heard that we've talked about, whilst that's very important, um, we have to focus on how we retain um retain those GPs so you know to date um, have we any way of looking at G um, the figures of, of newly qualified GPs who are coming into to our health service 
who graduate maybe take a post up initially or move on to employment elsewhere um, is that something that we are keeping track of and looking at why that's happening um, sorry I thought there were more questions um, well I think just following on from the previous briefing I mean I think it's absolutely correct that retention of the workforce is key we, we've increased training places 121 um, we're not saying that's the end point by any means um, but it, it, it is a significant increase in what was the case less than 10 years ago eh? Um the challenges around um, retention of that workforce. The the 121 last year, or the most in, in the current the current year, it was initially undersubscribed. Um, so um, you know we managed to we kind of made some modifications to the program itself to to encourage <coughs> recruitment in the second tranche in, in February going by, and thankfully that that was successful and it is fully subscribed. But it does indicate that there is not a limitless supply of people who to to, to train for for the program. Um, so it becomes about recruitment and retention. I don't think we have numbers. I mean, I mean, there's no kind of there's survey work done with the kind of levers, but there's no kind of accurate statistics on where people go after they they qualify. We are working with Linda and the postgraduate uh, dean in, in respect of that to try and ascertain, because it's a very important aspect for us to understand. As you've outlined, once we train the individuals. Um, are they staying to work in Northern Ireland? Are they going elsewhere? How much time are they actually uh, working in Northern Ireland, even if they stay in GMS? Uh, because we do have uh, new trainees who uh, graduate, get their CCT, but then may want to do other aspects. Um, and the difference between getting a CCT and, and working as a GP, your first entry to the workforce is um, as a locum. Mm -hmm. You know, um, some GPs will have salary posts, etc., lined up, but the majority enter the workforce as a locum, um, and it's difficult to understand what their pattern of work is because we're not in contract with them. Mm -hmm. But we are working with them to try and put in place a process whereby we could capture uh, those numbers. Capture: Are they staying? Are they going? If they are going, where are they going to? Um, so that we can learn and try to build in place um, more of a, a, an ability to attract and retain our workforce, our trained workforce here in Northern Ireland. I suppose on, on the back of that then, for, for those um, GPs who are leaving, as, as we've heard earlier, um, mid-career, um, or, or even some of the younger GPs that are leaving the, the, um, the, the role, are we here and get? Are we using that to get any feedback from those? Because I think that's very important to find out their reasons for leaving at that stage. We are aware of it, you know, largely because of you know <coughs> some of the feedback today. But I think we should be proactive in trying to, to gauge that so that we can, in terms of a retention strategy. And I know um, we will see the, the a document launched on that next week. Um, but I think that will hope hopefully inform the department in terms of what we need to put in place. Yeah, uh, that is something that we attempt to capture. Um, so whenever somebody uh, decides that they want to leave um, Northern Ireland um, and go further afield, uh, they usually contact my team um, because I manage the performers list, etc. So to get some advice as to, firstly, how long can they be away before they would have to potentially, you know, um, reapply to the performers list. Um, so at that stage, we try and capture, um, well, why, why did you make that decision? Now, they're not mandated to give us the answer to that, but we try and capture it. Um, and we, we, by and large, get returns, and, and it's, it's really due to their, their family commitments. They want to go and, and perhaps take up a role in Australia or uh, New Zealand, but they are small in number in respect of that. Um, just gonna add, it's worth that, just adding, I, mean, I think th there's no doubt that we need to understand we need to <coughs> where, if people are leaving, why they're leaving and in what sort of numbers, but I think it's worth just adding that there were more people working as GPs by headcount in Northern Ireland than ever before. Um, the, the numbers of people who, um, from the appraisal data, it's up 11% since 2014, so I mean there were more people, that there's a workforce here, now, uh, as has been touched on in other presentations, those people aren't for various reasons in a position to work what would have been once seen as a full-time role. I mean, it's not, they, they're, they're doing portfolio careers, they're doing uh, a considerable number of sessions in primary care, but it's, it's so there is a workforce here that there's just, we, we, we have available to us, and I think it's part of the challenge for us is to find ways of 
maximum giving them careers that they want to commit more of their time to GMS to kind of, kind of so, we, so we're getting more return in Northern Ireland for the investment in their training. Yeah. And I suppose that leads into my next question around the fact that we have more GPs. You've, you've alluded to it yourself there in, in that they're working less hours in terms of part time. We've heard some of the reasons why. Um, because of the workload pressure mm -hmm. um, and also we maybe have more uh, younger families and, and trying to achieve that work-life balance um, but uh, to get to a space where we are reducing the pressures on GP practices so that we are seeing more hours worked because we've, we've heard even the vast number of appointments that are seen on a daily basis never mind a weekly basis um, despite a, despite less capacity um, what are we doing to try and address that? Can just actually on the the, that, this, the numbers on consultation, just to clarify the, the comment, of it, that's that's not just GPs, that's the wider practice team. So I, I think just just to make sure everyone that would include if there's an MDT in place, but also include practice nurses, the pharmacists. So it's that's the it's not just GP activity that's captured in those in those published figure in those um quoted figures. Um, I sorry, I forgot the question. I'm just saying what's being done to address that. So what we're saying is we've more GP we've more GPs. Mm. But they're working less hours because mm. of all of the reasons that we have discussed yeah. in terms of the workload pressure, the you know all, the, the amount of people, the demand on the service, and um, what are we doing to try and address that so that people maybe are able to work more hours, which will have hopefully increased capacity, but also take the pressure off on the GPs that are trying to deliver that service and a good quality service, I think, um, which is is most important to them. Yeah. I think, I mean, as has been commented, it's the, 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 the source of the problems are multifactorial, so the kind of solutions are, <coughs> also, there's no one silver bullet that will help mm -hmm. with anything. I mean, I think in terms of um, getting people to want to work in GMS, I think there are increasingly trainees and, and younger doctors are opting for a portfolio career. So that they, they want to do a, a good portion of GMS work, but they want to do something else, be it training work, be it a particular specialism. I think one of the things that we can do, we would like to do more of, is to not is to kind of create opportunities for um, for GPs to do that, so that we can help help design for them roles that will mix their GMS work with maybe some work in a, in a health trust. And mm -hmm. this I mean this is all this kind of aspiration at the minute, but you'd, we'll probably come on to, to later on about the um, the work that's been going on on the practice stabilisation, in particular in Western Trust, and where we're trying to move towards a salary GP model now. This, the, the intention there is to have salary GPs working in, in GMS, but there's potential beyond that, and it's, it's under consideration as to how we can develop hybrid roles within that, so that people could work for a number of sessions in the in the practice, but also work in the trust as well, in, in particular specialised roles. So I mean, th that's an example of the kind of opportunity that's there. Um, yeah, if I could add to that, so um, I suppose I mentioned when a, a GP qualifies um, as a GP, it's their CCT as it's referred to, they enter the workplace usually uh, first off as a GP local. But we contract with practices, so it's up to the practice to decide how many partners they would have um, and also if they want to put in place a salaried uh, GP um, and how many GP locums they may well want to use if they, at this point in time, can attract a GP locum to work. Um, the, I think the emphasis for us has been on creating a better working environment within those GP practices so that we will have those younger GPs coming out wanting to uh, deliver time within general practice, maybe commit to a salaried post, maybe commit to a partnership, but also, um, as Garod referred to, a lot of the younger GPs and and at whatever stage of your career, GPs like to do other things. They like to have portfolio uh, careers. They like to have special interests. And that's where the GP with enhanced skills comes into it. And, and that did, we know, retain GPs within Northern Ireland and within GMS. Um, but other uh, areas that uh, general practice can lead to uh, and create that uh, good working environment for the GPs to stay is um, being able to support our practice to attract more of those salaried and, and partnerships. Um, and that's where we've put in place um, an attract, recruit, retain scheme. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's referred to in your pack, um, whereby we support those practices to try and attract a new partner, to try and attract a new GP in to deliver you know, a salaried commitment. 
I think if there's more commitment by the GPs on a regular basis to a practice, that in itself makes it a better working environment for the partners um, and for the, re the remainder of the staff. Um, so it, it's about trying to improve that general working environment within the independent contractor model of an in, you know, a, a single practice. Okay, thank you. My very last point, just on the indemnity scheme, um, and I'm conscious that there's negotiations ongoing for the one year, um, but are you able to give any indication about the long-term consideration around that? Um, uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, well, just as has been referenced, I mean, we have been dealing with indemnity in the context of the, the, the current, what's now the current year's contract, and we are thankfully very close to agreement on that. Um, I think as Francis said, that's going to be an interim solution. Um, we work is ongoing on on the long-term solution. I mean, we we're, we're doing an options appraisal through kind of the business case process, and the options within that would range from well, would range from status quo to a fully step back scheme along the lines of what Alan has um, outlined earlier. Um, none of those are without um, are without cost and without and without transfer of risk. So I mean, I think that we does does that does work to be done on to land on what the final model will be. Um, we are working on it actively. We have been engaging intensely with our colleagues in the BMA um, in through on, on, on the issue more widely and on an interim solution to it just for, for this current year. Um, but we will be progressing the kind of the wider options of present business case uh, over the next number of months. Yeah, my final, final, final point is um, in his closing remarks, um, Dr. Alan Stout had said, you know, that if the funding issue isn't addressed if we aren't starting to look at the investment in primary care we are facing a major collapse which we would have been aware of anyway that it is heading in that direction from the department's perspective then what work is happening that we can try within the financial constraints mm -hmm. we all understand that but there are i would imagine there are things that can be done about looking at things differently that will help to avoid that because we are very much dealing with the, the the symptoms of the problem but instead of getting to the crux of it and getting the investment where it needs to go so can you give any information or indication around that? Yeah, I'll that. Well, I mean I suppose just to kind of rewind a little bit I mean the, the figure from the audit office report of 5.4% uh, of the total health budget um, that's, that's not a that doesn't capture the entirety of what's invested in primary care I think it does and a lot of what we would view as the solutions to what, we, what we're doing and want to do more of would not be captured in that 5.4 percent so for example um it doesn't include the investment that's made through the mdt program for example it doesn't or the practice-based pharmacist program or advanced nurse practitioners so we, we've strategically if you look at it in terms of a uh, there been a demand capacity problem has been a fundamental problem in primary care we've you know strategically been trying to address the the, the capacity side of that by 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 training more GPs, but also by increasing the size of the practice teams and the range of professions that are available within there. Um, the MBT team, is, it's, it's, it's far from, I'm sure we'll cover it later on, but we, it's far from complete. Um, but we currently invest £25 million recurrently every year in, in that scheme. So that's, that's not a figure that's captured in the 5.4%. The practice-based pharmacy scheme is £19.5 million every year. Again, not captured in that. So a lot of, there's a lot more... Um, investment in every sense of the word in solutions then is just captured in a single figure um, what we where our intention is um, in terms of trying to deliver something that's going to significantly improve things and, and shift the needle to avert the kind of um, scenario that was outlined in your final question um, I mean I mean minister has been very clear on this um, from his previous time in and, and since returning I mean MDT it's not it's not a silver bullet and it's not a, a, a cure to all ills but it is we think one of the most significant things that we can do to stabilise the system as it currently is and to make it a viable um, location for transformation as we move forward and, and deliver better outcomes for patients. So MBT is really, if you want to say what's the one thing we're doing, MBT is really, really important in that sense. Um, obviously, we, we've, talked, we've touched on the contract itself has been a key element for how, how, we, how, how we design the service we want and how, we kind of, how GPs are obviously re rewarded and, and, and for, for participation in that. Um, the, we've done a lot of work this year, to, uh, and we, we are doing a lot of work this year to get kind of some modifications to the contracting approach. That's not the end of the story there. So we do have um, a commitment to work with NAGPC over the coming year on a substantive form of how the funding model works, because it's, it's been, what, 2004, so it's come in 20 years since the funding model was agreed. 
when it was the Dakar Hill, it's, it's Dakar Hill formula is the, is the how the funding is allocated for um, for the core uh, um, uh, global sum um, element of, of, of what practices get. Um, it's it from its, it was built to reflect things like uh, deprivation and and inequalities. But it's 20 years on, the things have moved on. So I think there's a need to revisit that and make sure that it actually is representative of what the need is out there. Um, those, are, those, are, those are two of, of, the, of the big things. Obviously, we want to progress with um, you know, if, if at least maintaining the training numbers in GP to try and to kind of keep the progress that we've, we've made there. Um, we you know, just work on a host of other issues. I mean, on uh, kind of the capital side, on, on kind of uh, both on the kind of large scale building program, um, which takes a long time, but also with a significant investment every year in in practice extensions and in, 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 in maintenance of practice to try and make sure that they're fit for purpose, can accommodate an NBT when they are available, and um, are just a better place to work and can provide better services for people. Okay, and I, t I take your point in all of that. I suppose where I'm coming from is that even with even where the MDTs and things are in place and are working well, they're still way, way, you know, it sh falls way, way short of capacity in terms of the, the ability of GPs to meet the demand that serve the service mm -hmm. of the people that still need to see their GP. We're hearing the same in emergency medicine um, that we've, we've put lots of things in place, phone first, all of these different services to filter out the people that maybe don't need to essentially mm -hmm. see whether it's a GP or need to go to their ED. But the reality remains that we need to invest in the workforce. We need to improve um, the conditions that people are working in if we really want to provide the service that is good quality, is getting to the, the, the crux of the issue before it becomes a crisis. So I'm not looking you to come back to me on that, but I think that's where yeah, we need to... I, do, I, mean, I just will very, very quickly just... Um, I mean, I take the point entirely that we have MBT and it's not it's not necessarily kind of the cure, but it's, we only have part of the MDT. And, you know, those areas that have got it, the rate of contract handback is much, much less. So of the 24 that we've had in the past two years, three had an MDT, uh, had a partial MDT, none had a full MDT. Um, so, you know, you can see there's a... It's very hard to kind of measure all the reasons for why a practice will hand this contract back, but there's, there's a correlation, at least, between having an MDT in place and more stability in that practice. So, I mean, I do think it will help. Even you know, further implementation of it will help. If, if I could just add very quickly, um, conscious of time, um, but uh, the <coughs> other aspect that we're looking at is, is population health. So looking at the needs of our population today and the presentations that our general practitioners um, have in front of them. Now, you know, the um, Car Hill formula, is, as Groot referred to, um, had aspects of deprivation and demography in that, but it is very old. So we now need to look at our population as it is today and assess what funding is going into the practice to meet the needs of their patients. So that is a big piece of work. We started this year, but we have so much to do in 24-25 to understand that. And that, in turn, will have an impact on how we develop the MDT because the cohort of staff that we put in the MDT to start off with was based on um, a case mix survey that we looked at as to presentations to our GP practices and what were the bulk of the presentations. That's how we, we came to the practice-based physios, the mental health workers and the social workers. Um, but that was only the start of our journey. And, and as I say, that population health assessment of <coughs> what our population needs look like today, impact that and look at what other roles do we now need to develop to come into our GP practices to help them meet the needs of their patients. Thank you, uh, Colin. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. If we continue to do what we're doing today and nothing else, do you think that primary care is going to collapse? The Royal College of GPs and British Medical Association said yes in 12 to 18 months. Do you agree with them? Uh, if you don't agree with them, then you must be doing something different that they're not aware of. And if that's the case, why are you not sharing with them the interventions that you're going to do to stop it collapsing in 12 to 18 months? Well, I, mean, I think as I've touched on already, I mean, we, the further rollout of MT, for example, I mean, that, that programme is not yet near its full potential and is not yet in widely established enough or, um, um, or as Margaret alluded to, uh, you know, just this, that that isn't that would be the start point. Just that the model should evolve with time as well. So, it's not that there's something new to, and it, it's but it's new to it'll be new to 
10 out of the 17 federations that we have. So, I mean, there's, there's a significant proportion of the population here that doesn't yet have access to the model. Our, 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 we, one of our key priorities is to ensure that model. We do believe that that will have a significant um, stabilising effect. And I, I, I would say that it, in the terms of your question, it would count as a new intervention because it is simply isn't everywhere at the minute. Um, but there's other things too. I mean, we've touched on um, the, uh, the role of the access group, for example. And I mean, I, 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 I think there was a question around well, whether we were kind of forcing that down a digital route. And I would, I would, I would say no. I mean, um, but the digital um, and, and technology does have real potential to help it's not going to replace the need for clinicians and it's not going to replace the need for um, uh, uh, admin staff either, but it can help with better, um, a better experience for patients, number one. We've kind of talked about the, kind of the IVO recordings and, ha and what, how people are communicating, how, how they are informed as to what's happening, where they are in the queue, but other, being able to access through other means, be it through online booking, be it through text messages. Um, but there's also capacity for better through technology for better signposting for patients so that currently if you are ill or think you're ill you can you can go to your GP if it's not you can maybe go to your out of hours or to your or to the ED so there's no very good alternative we are we are driving people towards the front door of our building because that's where they can get help from so there's more just capacity or potential rather to do a lot in providing better advice for self-management and <coughs> in online through apps. It's not going to replace it because it, it won't work for everyone, but I think those are the kind of things that we can do more of that will be new and will help to improve things and will help to siphon off some of the pressure, help to give breathing space to practices, help to give that sense of hope that I think some of the previous presenters talked about, that this is, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom and a lot of, um, you know, justifiably a lot of, a lot of um, angst about, you know, the level of pressure and how sustainable it is, and I think we hear the cry for 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 hope and for optimism and for for a plan. So these are the kind of things I think we can point to that will help to avert that. I appreciate you can only say what you can say, but if you're telling us that a few signposts and an app is going to save primary care, I'm very concerned. But I appreciate I said, well, it was pretty much what was contained in there. And in terms of MDTs, I know that several of us um, were part of the panel that met with the. Um, permanent secretary during the time that the assembly was down and we were told at that presentation that there was no more funding for NDTs and in fact what was quite worrying is that we were told that they may have to take the additional uh, support that is there for MDTs and actually spread them around further which would actually dilute what is available in MDTs in current uh, provisions and then allow that to be spread around the others. Could we maybe ask Chair um, if the panellists can I be right back to us on that, or if not, if we could write to the department and ask them, is there additional funding for MDTs in the next three years? Uh, yes. And if there is a potential of any change to that in I the years? Answer. I mean, I know, I mean the, well, first, the first thing to say is that, the, as we've said before, the further development of the programme is subject to um, additional funding made available. As things stand, we don't have a source of funding. That's why there has been you know, a lack of progress over the past kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, the budget for next year and, and beyond that isn't set. So we are, we, are ma we are making plans for, you know, how we would implement, what that would cost, and working with colleagues to kind of see, well, where can, can funding be sourced from? That, is, that work isn't, isn't complete yet. We don't have numbers to work with yet. So um, <coughs> there's, there's certainly, and, and you know, I think a best case scenario, when budgets are made available, it'll be a one year budget. So the, the, our ability to say what exactly the funding will come from in, in years beyond that, we, I don't expect we'll be in a position to do that. We've no confirmed extra funding for MDTs as it stands. Well, as, it, as it stands, we've no confirmed funding for anything. You know, there is no budget. Okay, yeah. thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just going to get straight to questions because I, I know that you're probably eager to get away um, to um, and just following on um, with regards to we know that there's no budget. I appreciate the position that um, all departments are in because of where we are. Um, but surely a, a business case has been presented to the Department of Finance for the Department of Health and we've seen part of it um, regarding multidisciplinary teams and then should funding maybe not might be a hundred percent about what you've asked for but should you get funding would the rollout be quicker um for mdts because if it is so vital to stabilizing the service if the fundings are how quick will the rollout actually um be 
Yeah, so we've been developing plans for further rollout. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, the working it's, it's it, we, the minister announced the um, the uh, the rollout order in t 2022, so it's a couple of years ago now. And, and the idea is that that will take um, it'll it'll move forward in different tranches. So be the first on the on the other side from memory it was East Belfast, no, East East Antrim, North Belfast, and the South West were the first three, and then the ne another block of three, and then another block of four after that. Um, the current planning is that we will well, I suppose I'll say two things. Um, we are we don't have an envelope to work with, but I think we we're keen to see you know the the, the, when the original. Um, version of MDT, there was a cost associated with it of something like apparently, uh, approximately 116 million for full implementation across all of Northern Ireland. We're looking to see well what, how we could um, um, deliver as much as we could within a within a, a smaller financial envelope over the next period. So um, that would be a mixture of looking at um, the, the kind of the mix of roles um, and the kind of maybe the, the how many of uh, of given roles are, are going to be in the model. And also the sequencing on that. So um, um, the intention would be that we would, if 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 we, if we got green light tomorrow and had funding available, we would immediately start work on finishing recruitment in the areas where we're currently on the ground because it was not yet complete, and starting work in the next in the next um, three areas. Um, the, the intention would be then we would we wouldn't rather than have um, uh, everybody across the Ireland trying to recruit the same people at the same time. It, we take a staged approach so that then the next uh, tranche would be probably 12 months, would commence 12 months after that. Whilst you know, we wouldn't expect the first one would be finished by that point, but you take it in trying to a, a year apart. So ultimately, if we got the green light tomorrow, within two years, we would have recruitment commenced across all areas in, the, in, in Northern Ireland. That's, that, that's on current planning. Now, that's not set in stone, and there may be scope to expedite in certain areas, but that, that's the kind of the, um, the, the current thinking. And um, when you say all areas, can you clarify whether you mean all GPs practices or? I mean all. So we're doing. We've been doing it on a federation by federation basis. So yeah. seventeen federations. So it would be, it would be within each um, federation would have, would have commenced in that area. In that area. I, the, how it, how it would break down in, in 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 individual federations would be kind of agreed locally by the project boards. So it's probably not the case that every practice in every federation mm -hmm. would start something, but some would, and then over the next kind of three to four years. The, it would fill out from from that starting point. If I could add as well, um, in the background we've also been obviously if you have an MDT, not all practices have the space, so mm. we've also been developing premises, um, and we've been taking that through, um, you know, in the intervening time when we've had to stall uh, due to lack of funding, but we have continued to look at premises development in in those areas in line with the MDT rollout. So. We will be able to move faster. Okay. I look forward to, to, to seeing that and, and in North Belfast, one of the, the ones in the first. Yeah, that, that, the so that running order remains yeah. in place. So. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to go back to the indemnity issue and ask, mm -hmm. um, it is my understanding that the Minister had requested that options be, be put um, in front of him by November 2022, um, when at that stage it was the caretaker minister, but still a minister. Um, and I understand that there was no assembly for um, until January of this year, but um, you know, wh why have options not been developed for long term um, um, options for the indemnity for GPs? Like why, even though a minister had asked for options to be placed in front of him, are we still just working on a short term basis? I know, I know about funding. I know that we can't deliver something if we don't have funding, but we can still look at the options as to what would be best for long term. Mm -hmm. So. Um, why, well, I mean, why is that? I, I, I suppose we are look, we are looking at the. I mean, the at a very high level, the the range of options is you know it's not that complicated. You, you could either do nothing at all. You could do some sort of a subsidised scheme, or you could do something like a step back scheme. And there'd, there'd be different flavours within that. You know, in terms of how exactly it would work in practice, it really comes down to an, al an analysis of the um, the, <coughs> the the costs involved, the the transfer of risk involved, and then you know. As you'll, you will all know, um, the business case process is pretty demanding in terms of the kind of the different uh, cases that need to be made and satisfied for any kind of intervention. So, we've been looking at this through the business case lens because ultimately, if we're going to do something in the space, it'll, that's that's how we will have to do the appraisal. Um, you know, it's it's multi. There's just you know uh, there are there are challenges in you know um, 
tension, should we say, between the needs of the service and then the pure economics of the move. So, so trying to satisfy the economicus and something and balancing that with the needs of the service is, is something that we've been working, lo- working around to try and do. So it is, unfortunately and by necessity, it's a very laborious process. And do you um, develop that business case before you get... Um, so do you develop a business case for every, every option before going to the minister um, in its full extent? You know, I'm... I'm sure no, after the, the minister decides which option no, well, the, 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 the business the, 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 it's a it's a staged process mm-hmm. so I mean the, the outline business case would give a high level appraisal but it's high level but it still is relatively detailed of what what the option, what the options are once you do that initial appraisal there's a a further detailed process on the outline business case and the um the the, the um so so the outline case in the first place then the outline business case and then the, the, the kind of full business case so um we we've we've been able to brief minister on what on what the the options are, but that detailed analysis of what they look like in detail and to to allow, to allow a, a, a I guess a fully formed view to be taken that that work is still ongoing. So how many years will be looking at short term um, easements? So, um, my understanding we had the one last year um, in terms of the indemnity costs for GPs, and we're looking at another this year. How many more years? for short-term measures, um, given if one of the options requires legislative change and that may not be doable in this mandate, how many short-term years are we talking about? Well, I mean, just just to be really clear, the the agreement that we've been working on is for one year, and, and, and that, that, that contract is only one year, so we've no agreement beyond that. Yeah. Um, the, the, it's not the second year of that, though, so what was done previously, the, the million years, uh, that, was in, that, that was only a... a and in the in, in your top up, how many different easements will there need to be for GPs before we actually get um, a long term solution? I mean, the work is ongoing. I mean, we're we're looking to expedite that as quickly as possible. I don't I don't have an answer to that. And in terms of the discussions we've had with NITPC, we've no agreement with them over yeah. years beyond the upcoming year. Okay, well, um, thank you, and I'm sure we'll no doubt um, go back to the to the issue again. And I wanted to ask if you had if. The um, department has done any assessment um, regarding the cost of trust run practices um, and the effect that that's not just the, the assessment of the cost, but the effect that it's been having on neighbouring um, neighbouring GP practices that aren't able to attract DOCOM GPs because um, the trust run GP practices are securing those loco- locums at quite a high rate. I ask that we can keep this as quick as possible yeah. because um, yeah. we're, we're on a loose quorum very quickly and we've a lot more to get, still get through. So I'm not, I don't mean to be rude, but just I'm very yeah. conscious. Uh, well, yeah, so you're aware that we've been working with trust, in particular in Western Trust, but also in, in, in the southern area um, to hold contracts. I mean, the, the problem has been that's been very reliant on locum cover. Um, we're trying to move away from that. So I think we've done a couple of things have, have been happened very recently. So we've We've agreed that the, the kind of the, the very high level of locum fees is going to, has been reduced from the end of April, so that that, that will help to contain the cost within that. Um, and we're looking, um, we're working with with um, the Western Trust in particular to kind of move from that locum based service to one where they can employ salary GPs, which again will have to contain the costs. Um, in terms of the overall cost of it, I mean, it's it's it's, it's effectively it's invoice. It's a it's a different funding model to normal practices. It's mm-hmm. it's yeah, yeah. So um, at the minute, when we're working with the trusts, whilst they're holding these contracts on a temporary basis, it's not based on global sum like every other practice. It's just based on invoice. And we don't we have done some analysis, uh, and yes, at the minute, because of the increase um, of the locum costs, it does. Um, have a higher cost than a, 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 a normal, as I would say, GMS practice run. But that's why we're taking steps to put in place salary posts uh, to uh, ensure that those high locum costs um, are stopped. That's but they, they, they were needed at the time yeah. to keep the practice open. Uh, Linda and then Danny. My point's actually been covered, Chair, so okay. Danny. Danny, come on. Yeah. Um, yeah, th- thanks very much for that, guys. W- we were told very clearly there that the budget that GPs were getting out of the health budget or the percentage was 5.4%. Now, you've queried that. Uh, we've been told that we need uh, 11 or 12% for a healthy population, which is significantly below or significantly way above what we're actually getting. Mm-hmm. First question then, uh, you've you made a couple of points about the, the MDT programme, the cost of the MDT programme and the cost of uh, a pharmacy programme, I think you referred to as well, as not being included in the 5.4%. Yeah, yeah. What is the real figure? That's my first question. If you could give us the real figure, the real percentage of 
um, the health budget that is being directed towards GPs. You've queried what that figure yeah. is. You've said that that figure is wrong. Mm. Could you give us the real one? Do you mind if I just go through these? Please, please, yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. So I, I would want to see the real percentage figure then if, if you've queried uh, what that is. And obviously, I, I suspect that, again, will be significantly below the 11 or 12 per cent. So we would need to see a plan that is moving towards that 11 and 12 per cent. And I, I want to hear just you know, what, your, what your plan is to move towards that. What we heard from the GPs very, very clearly was um, MDT is great. It stabilises practice, but it's no silver bullet. What they need is more GPs. Um, you know, what, what are your plans to increase the GP uh, training numbers? Um, they were talked about, obviously, an incremental increase over um, over a number of years, up to a number of 169, I think, is the the figure that was quoted. Can you tell me what what you're doing to progress that increase in places? Um, I just want to go back as well. It, I, I quoted earlier on the audit of audit office report about GP practices. They were saying that almost one in three GP practices have sought crisis support service in the last four years. Um, 13 practices hand back their contracts. This is a crisis. The GPs, and as Colin pointed out, 12 to 18 months, uh, Dr. Um, Stout said, 12 to 18 months from collapse. You know, this we are in the middle of a crisis here, so you know we have to take real, real measures in order to try and um, build up where we are uh, and to try to get to a more, more stable place. I do note that there was a bit of um, news today just about the contract negotiation, and I think that's still ongoing. Um, the question relating to that is, uh, are you reviewing the funding level for the core delivery contract services? I think it's at £163 per patient at the minute, but this is dependent upon enhanced service and doesn't take into account the amounts of consultations. Is that part of the ongoing negotiations? I don't know whether you'd be able to speak to that or not. And the other thing was just about supporting GPs um, when they're having lack of maternity cover and sick leave and things like that in practice, because they can obviously have a big impact on... Um, the ability of the, the practice to deliver. Okay. Sorry for hitting you with lots of questions. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I haven't got them all. <laughs> yes. me. Um, sorry, just on the, uh, just get written around for all them. I, was, I, 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 was, I wasn't um, questioning the figure. I'm just saying it's not. That figure is for what goes into, if you want to call it the core GMS. So that, that's the practice income. The other, we've been investing in primary care more widely, and that's, and the, that's, that's what I mean, those numbers aren't captured there. I haven't got, I can come back with figures on what the overall level of investment in primary care looks like, and I will, I'm sure we can get something on how that relates to the overall budget, but I wasn't questioning the figure that's been quoted from the odd office. That is an accurate figure, but it's just, it's not fully representative, is all I'm saying. If you could give us the real figure or what you believe to be a more representative figure, I would be very interested in seeing that. I can come back with that if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, in relation to... If I take the second point, if that's okay. It was in relation to more GPs and the training numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually chair, we co-chair the, the training numbers, GP training numbers workforce, mm -hmm. um, and of which we have NIGPC and RCGP colleagues on that. Um, and it was the work that myself, my team and Grow did to bring forth a paper whereby we secured the increase um, of the uh, increase in TAIN and, and also put forward evidence to maintain that. Mm -hmm. We're very well aware we need to develop that and grow um, and we um, are continuing our work <coughs> to put more um, evidence in respect of what exactly does that end point look like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's a moving feast because every time we get to one point you know uh, other other challenges have come on top and we need to increase it further but as colleagues have already said previously we would never jump to that anyway in one fell sweep mm -hmm. it would have to be an incremental aspect because we wouldn't have the practices there to to train um, mm -hmm. our GPs and with the increase in the undergraduates also getting exposure to general practice which is great mm -hmm. that also takes up training capacity within our practices so that work is ongoing um, we won't let it stall um, mm -hmm. and there will be further iterations of papers and proposals which will go to our minister but obviously that's all in the aspect of the financial constraints and, and there's a point on the the contract and the kind of the fund had the funding makeup. I think it is to, to kind of summarise that. I mean, without going into the details, I mean, we're near, we're near agreement. The, the, what we've been seeking to through this process is to simplify things for GPs, so there's less administrative work, less chasing of what they would, the targets through the various the qualified elements and the enhanced service elements. So we've been the ask of us was to 
is there a, can, can a greater proportion of their income be delivered through core, so it is just for delivery of their service? And that's, that's the basis in which we've been having these discussions, and we've been able to make some, make some very good progress towards that for this year. So I, 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 it's not really possible to give the details at this point, but mm. that's the, we, we're working in that, in that space. Yeah, if, I, if I give an example of what we did in the 23-24 year, mm. um, uh, we froze COAF. Now, COAF is not core. COAF mm. is um, an enhanced um, and an additional aspect of general practice that all of our practices and throughout Northern Ireland have always contracted to provide, but it is not core GMS. So they had to attain certain thresholds in order to receive payment against clinical condition areas. So we froze that this year in the respect of practices not having to attain thresholds, but they weren't financially penalised. And we allowed them to focus on those best they, they would look that clinically required that input and that we've taken that into our contract negotiations for the 24-25 year. I don't want just about maternity and sickness cover, just about practices that are impacted. Yep, so um, our GPs and our practices are paid and they, they know they're paid mm. on the basis of their local sum, but all of the rules around that sit within we, what we call as the SFE, the Statement of Financial Entitlement, and that lays out what aspects of reimbursement or support we'll give to practices. Um, there are amounts in there that we would reimburse against sickness, paternity um, and maternity. Um, the sickness um, we have actually paid uh, from day one for the past number of years mm -hmm. to support our practices uh, when we're only due to pay uh, from week six. So that is additional might that we have mm. supported our practices. Uh, and we introduced that during COVID, obviously, given the, the, the issues that were, we were all um, and challenges we were all dealing with. Um, there are financial issues in respect of if we are to change any other support within the SFE. Um, and that's something that we will consider <coughs> as we move forward. Thank you. Um, just, I, don't, I don't want to cut it off very bluntly, but I suppose if members, because I know certainly I probably have more questions myself, if members have any additional questions, we could feed them in through the clerk and, and forward them on even for written response, if that's Absolutely. okay. Um, again, that's been very, very helpful, so appreciate your time, and I'm sure this will be an ongoing conversation um, in the short term anyway as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, very quickly then, we've still quite a bit to get through. Um, if I could ref take you to item number 10, then we have two statutory rules. Wait, wait, maybe just before we finish that, um, is it our intention to bring the Minister up after the budgets are agreed, or is that an invitation that we could issue now? Because there's obviously always going to be constraints that officials have to be able to give you about funding commitments, but that's obviously been raised during that last discussion where... There will be funding commitment decisions that need to be taken that predicate whether or not primary care is going to collapse or not. So I don't think it would be a bad idea if we haven't already considered it, uh, uh, the Minister coming up after the budget's agreed to see exactly where the allocations are going and whether it's going to fund that NDT, which is apparently the absolute silver bullet that's going to save primary care. When is the Minister scheduled to the next come to committee? It, uh, at present, Chair, the... We've just an initial um, next briefing. The minister will be September time. So, well, at the minute, that's just based on the usual yeah. routine. So it is. Um, but if how that's often do we have? How often? Sorry, because I'm new to these yeah. committees. But how Aye. often would you have a minister? It, it to be honest, it, it depends. In in the previous mandate with COVID, I know the minister came up on a. It was nearly enough six weekly basis just because it was yeah. an update. I think normally with ministers it can be anywhere three to four times in a session. So it is which would be September through to um, June. Not a mandate, a session, sorry. No, yeah. just the session. It, it may be potentially we would want to come to brief the committee on the budget, I would imagine, anyhow. Um, but well, Chair, I'll, make, I'll make it a proposal that we invite him um, and, and whenever he's the budget settled because I mean, I'm not making big of this, but they've told us 12 to 18 months for primary care. Mm -hmm. If there isn't changes, the officials have told us that the changes are MDT, but there's no funding for it, and there's a budget that's due to be set. I think there's a couple of dots there that it's incumbent upon us as a health committee to join, or at least be able to show that they're not joined, and I, th I think that's our role. So I'll make it a proposal. Can I ask, is September likely to be around the same time as I mean, the budget yeah. is? 
Well, the sun so it is I hope not. It should be set last week. <laughs> <laughs> it should be somewhere in April. So none of us can answer that question, I guess. Yeah. When, when it's set. So it's if it's set in May, if it could come up a couple of weeks later, if it's June a couple of weeks later, so it doesn't you know. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's fair enough. No, thank I think that's a fair point. Okay, yeah. members then, so just item number 10 is this two statutory rules relating to the misuse of drugs for consideration. Um, if I could refer you to tab 10 of your pack. Um, just before Anne leaves, we still have quorum. Okay. Just yeah. Just 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 what is the quorum? Five. 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 Okay, well, we'll slide through these. Uh, so, no, no questions then. <laughs> um, so, uh, a tab 10. So, th- this, uh, this SR 2024 uh, um, 37 makes additions to the list of designated controlled substances which had no legitimate medicinal use in, in the North. Um, I could advise members that the examiner's statutory rules had no comments to make on this SOR. And to remind you that they considered this proposal has already been considered by members um, at the meeting on the 29th of February, and the committee agreed that it was content with the merits of the policy and for the department to make the statutory rule. So, if you can ask members if they are content. Yeah. yeah. So, just to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SOR 2024 37, the Misuse of Drugs Designation Amendment Order NI 2024, and that no objection to the rule. Um, for item number 11, then, SOR 2024 36. Um, at tab 11 of your pack and again uh, members did consider this proposal for the SOR at the meeting on the 29th of February and agreed it was content with the merits of the policy and for the department to make the SOR and the examiner of statutory rules had no comments to make on this SOR either. Are members content with the rule? So just to agree formally then the Committee for Health has agreed has considered SOR 2024 36, the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Regulations NI 2024, and had no objection to the rule. Item number 12 is correspondence, so just to refer members to the list at tab 12.1, uh, which is page 274 to 501 of your pack, and to draw your attention to the following items. At tab 12.3 is the correspondence from the Minister providing an update on the action plans and strategies currently being implemented, including the mental health strategy, the cancer strategy, and the stroke action plan. Are members content to ask the Department to provide regular six monthly written updates on these strategies? Yeah. At tab 12.4 is correspondence from the Minister advising is unable to provide clarity on the funding position for the Children's Hospice until the budget has been agreed. It also advises that officials met with the hospice staff on the 3rd of April. Um, I would propose that we ask the department to provide an update on the outcome of that meeting um, as quickly as possible because I'm conscious that that was last week. And also if we could potentially ask um, what consideration is given to reviewing the current funding model. Um, We met with Marie Curie earlier on and I'd I'd ask some questions around the funding model that they are... um, engaged with where they get 50-50 government funding and we talked a wee bit about it earlier on so I would be keen to hear the department's view on that because I'm sure that within their discussion with the children's hospice they, that, that was an issue that came up um, so members are content with that those proposals members are you content then with the remaining actions as listed on the memo at tab 12.1 um, sorry I, um, I just have a few issues I'll be very very quick um, 12.5 um, the reply regarding Rainbow Lodge. Um, oh, yes, yeah. um, I actually asked specifically around their funding, and then they didn't re- respond to that. Um, so responded essentially to the question they wanted to be asked. Um, and to be perfectly honest, whilst it is good that they're saying that the respite unit will be reopened in August, um, they have consistently told families that it will reopen at X date, um, and then it changes. So I don't really believe them. Um, I know that they're saying they're going to reopen it because one person's moving to an adult unit. So all along they've kind of known that, but it's provided different dates. Um, they also haven't said whenever the short term unit has been closed. So I, I, I think if we can just further write to them to say that we had sought clarity around the funding agreement or the funding arrangements. I mean, I know that their answer might be it's it's taken back into the trust now anyway um, but I think that's a, it's, a, it's a serious issue that if they have continued to fund a private organisation to run a service that was not operating um, sufficiently nor um, attracting staff in a way in which it should be which is my understanding of one of the problems um, 
I, I think it is an issue that the committee should be concerned about because we are talking about privately run facilities that are for the most vulnerable but should be run um, within our own um, health service. Um, so I, I think it's important that we, we write back to the committee. Keith, do you need me to, to reiterate any of that again? Are you, are you, you're, you're fine in that, thank you. And then the other issue was the dental amalgam mm -hmm. reply. I, I'm, I'm, could we just put it back on the agenda maybe again because it might take longer to I was going to make your proposal but I think it's probably beneficial if other other members are here and um, if we can put it back on the agenda for next week okay thank you um then item number 13 is the forward work program um an informal meeting has now been confirmed with mesh Ireland for Monday the 22nd of April uh, and an invite will be issued to members the committee strategic planning day is scheduled for the 25th of April and to prefer, prepare for an effective engagement and it's a pity that others aren't here but we maybe can circulate this as well by email. Um, the committee office have asked for members to, to um, forward their priorities ahead of that so that we can have a, a productive discussion on the day. If members can have suggestions can they please email the clerk who will collate these in preparation for the, for the session. Um, and more information on the venue and structure of the day will follow. Or, as or is it likely to be? Is it here or? Chair, yeah, we had planned that it was due to be up in the northwest. Unfortunately, it's not going to work out. So we are looking at other options, but they'll be a bit closer to, to Belfast. I know it didn't suit some of members as well, based on the uh, police board, board as well. Now, if it is closer to Belfast, I might get up for the latter part of it. We just had, no the, the, I think the plan the would be the, the, the planning part would be in the afternoon yeah, at a normal yeah. our normal committee time, but we might do something else mm -hmm. over lunch or something, um, just depending on um, what we can get arranged in the next couple of weeks. Well, it, it's in two weeks, is it? Yeah. Two weeks. Could we get as much notice? Because I know people fill my diary up for Thursday morning for stuff to do if we're here in the afternoon. So if we're somewhere else and we're doing extra time, or if we can put a time in now. Well, I think what we're looking at is maybe using the, the morning then to meet with maybe potentially organisations um, who, so we're, look, we're, we're trying to pin some of it down, we so, don't so know. So keep the whole the day clear for it basically? For now, yeah, and then yeah. we can, people okay. can work out what's it. I hope to have something a bit clearer yeah. by tomorrow with the latest, if not it'll be Monday. Yeah, but what we've said is the planning aspect of, of for the committee will keep for the afternoon. Um, are members content then to note the briefings to set out in the forward work programme? And just to remind <coughs> members of the session with the Youth Assembly next Thursday at 12.30 in the Long Gallery. And um, we will be hearing from them in relation to smoking and vapes LCM. And it'd be good to get a, as many people there as possible because I know they're very, very keen. Um, I definitely and, won't be there, Jeremy. My apologies. No okay, no problem. Um, and just the other thing, and under any other business, um, you will have circulated a save the date for the Heart Failure Warriors event, which is in room 115 on the Thursday the 6th of June. Um, it's scheduled 9 30 to 2 pm um, and everyone is invited and there'll be further information to follow from heart failure warriors but a very important event if people can attend anyone any other items of business they wish to raise okay, thank you members next meeting is next thursday the 18th of april at 2 pm in 20, room 29 so thank you all committee room 29 signed Committee Room 29, signed. <coughs> Committee Room 29, signed. <coughs> Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. <coughs> Committee Room 29, signed. <coughs> Committee Room 29, signed. <coughs> 